uh, or good morning rather. Welcome to the Enoch Factory Library, either here in person or via Zoom and Facebook Live. Um, I'm Library President and CEO, Heidi Daniel, and I want to welcome the mayor and all of our other dignitaries here today as we celebrate Baltimore Day Week. We are so happy to be co-hosting co this hybrid event with our partners at the Baltimore Neighborhood Indicators Alliance, otherwise known as VENIA. And I want to thank Director Seema Iyer and her staff. The work VENIA does helps organizations like the Pratt Library truly make a difference in the city of Baltimore by providing open and accurate data about our communities. This has been a challenging 18 months. COVID-19 has changed the way we do business as a library and also the way the world does business. The pandemic has exposed the inequities in our city, most that we already knew were there. At the Pratt Library, our mission is to provide equitable access to information, services, and opportunities. From the start of the pandemic, the Pratt increased our digital resources for our customers, specifically databases to help students learn in a new online environment. We purchased hotspots and tablets to lend to our students for free to keep them connected to their learning and their classrooms. We installed driving Wi-Fi at eight of our branches, providing free internet around the clock outside of those buildings. And we started a pop-up cohort, cohort at our Pennsylvania Avenue branch, providing long-term lending of Chromebooks and one-on-one -on -one virtual tech and job search opportunities to our customers. All of the Pratt's programming, story time, to major author programs continued on virtual platforms. And today, all 22 locations of the Pratt Library are open to the public as we continue to adhere to safety protocols to keep our staff in the We're looking at the lessons of this past year, what it has taught us to improve and expand all of our services in the future. And of course, data about our communities plays a major role in that decision making. For so many, our libraries are the only safe place that can get critical free services. And we will continue to focus on using the latest data to provide the opportunities our communities need the most. Now it's my pleasure to introduce another person focused on making a difference in Baltimore. His vision continues to inspire me and I hope all of you as we move forward. I'm pleased to introduce to you Mayor Brandon Scott. Thank you, Hi, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Everyone here and everyone in virtual on Zoom. And thank you, Hi, and for that wonderful introduction. But more importantly, uh, for your vision and what the Pratt Library does every day uh, for Baltimore, especially Baltimore fans. Uh, we know uh, that this institution is one that truly lives and breathes equity and does things in neighborhoods uh, that many people are afraid to go help and serve those uh, young people and their families who want to say thank you. And I am glad to be here again for day to day. I think that I've been here seeing my can probably for most of them and understanding uh, for us, uh, data is going to continue to be a pillar of my administration. I think it's been almost 10 years uh, since I introduced Baltimore's open data law, and we know the city has come a long way, but we have so far to go. And when I think about data, uh, I think about a saying that I always uh, used to say uh, to younger elected officials around the country, a better informed uh, citizenry is a better citizen. And we know for a long time, Baltimore kept information away from its residents, away from its partners, away from uh, business individuals. And when uh, we are sharing data uh, with our residents about the things that are happening in their communities, we then empower them to be an even deeper partner on how we can work together to solve the solutions that face our city. Uh, so uh, for me, uh, that's why we're always going to believe and push data everywhere. But it's also about making sure that we have the infrastructure to do that. So there are a few things that I want to the highlight. One, we talked about uh, the introduction and passing of the law almost 10 years ago. Uh, we know that Open Baltimore uh, serves as a huge resource for many individuals and it houses hundreds of government uh, data sets regularly updated uh, by our city agencies for 
greater transparency, accountability, and access to your local government. The Open Baltimore Hub also allows people to interact with data, uh, download files, and analyze and visualize data with tools and build apps. Uh, this is something that I was actually a part of on the front end as a staffer and then uh, with the legislation and now had the honor as mayor to relaunch this in a way that we can have much more impact with our communities. It is our duty uh, as a government to ensure that city government works for our residents and with our residents. And Open Baltimore is a powerful tool uh, that will allow us to do that uh, in a trans, a trans, uh, a very, very open, a transparent and a way that holds us accountable. Both transparency and accountability are top priorities for me. We also, and we're joined here today by uh, both of these, uh, these gentlemen, uh, we also uh, did something that uh, I thought was very critical. We know, as you heard from Heidi, uh, that COVID uh, exposed or further exposed for us in Baltimore pre existing inequities that have existed in Baltimore longer than I've been alive. But uh, none was more clear uh, than that of the digital divide because in the blink of an eye, the whole world went to working online and then everyone was reminded about how working or learning online. And everyone was reminded in Baltimore and across the world about how many of our people don't have access to the internet, uh, which is, uh, we like to say now, is the 21st century's electricity. Because if you don't have it, you can't, you won't be able to survive, let alone thrive. So one of the things that we did was we went out and we brought in a digital equity director, Jason. Uh, in today's world, everything is facing data. And as mayor, it's my duty to ensure that we do, uh, what we do is rooted in data and the residents have equitable access to those opportunities and data to access. In the beginning, uh, I appointed not just Jason, but also our, our first chief data officer, Justin. <laughs> We are uh, one of the few cities that has a, a executive level digital equity director that sits in my office. So it shows how important it is to us. And both the chief data officer and the digital equity director are going to play integral roles on this team, are working to improve our data practices, obviously, but also working in a very real way to break down the digital divide so that uh, so many of our families are actually able to have that new 21st century utility or necessity uh, known, known as the internet. Uh, we did a big thing uh, a few months ago, Open Checkbook, uh, which is raising the bar in our opinion when it comes to using data to manage the city, but also is a huge step in transparency for the city of Baltimore. It's now really an expectation that data are part of every conversation and every decision that we're making in Baltimore City. And that we're fully transparent about where our residents' hard-earned dollars are going and where they're spent. The public open checkbook tool includes information on how we spend our money with the vendors and its updated quarter. With this tool, Baltimoreans can experience our budget in action, but for me, it serves as a way for folks to hold us accountable because they can see where that money is going, who it's going to, and it allows our residents to be a part of something uh, that people have asked for for decades. They didn't know who would the city was spending money on and what we we're spending money on. And again, I think for us, this is about showcasing our commitment, not just the transparency, but as I say to our city administrator, our first city administrator, Chris Shorter, all the time about how we're showing people that we're building a brand new Baltimore City government from the foundation up, doing it through a lens of equity, uh, uh, Dana, and doing it so that uh, I am handing off city government to the next person that will come uh, behind me in a much better fashion than I got it, and that they will have the systems, the practices, the structures in place to make sure that Baltimore can be the best version of itself. And the last thing I will, I will touch is about digital data locker, there are two more things. Uh, data use isn't just for city government. Uh, people use data every single day to track documents, money, and communications. Uh, we all know most everyone uses everything with their phone. I can't remember the last time that I've actually swiped my credit card at something. I normally just hold my cell phone next to it and check myself out. However, but we know that use of data isn't always equitable. 
Uh, that's why I am proud of our team uh, for the development of my digital data locker uh, to help Baltimore's most vulnerable residents maintain vital documents. Imagine if you are someone who uh, is a client of the Mayor's Office of Home and Services, allowing you to secret, securely store and share electronic copies of vital documents, such as birth certificates, government issue identification cards, with housing case managers, benefits program specialists, streamlining a critical step on the path to secure permanent housing. Because, uh, you know, my family's old school. Uh, so if you ask me where my original Social Security card is, I know it's in my parents' basement, in a file cabinet, <laughs> in a drawer, in a folder with my name on it. But uh, our residents who are su suffering or, or, or experiencing homelessness, they don't have a place. Mm -hmm. And you know we cannot, uh, it would be unhuman of us to expect them to hold that on their person and be able to just pull it up on the drop of a dime and while we're trying to help uh, them get into a better living situation. That is what uh, my digital data locker does for them. It allows them uh, the opportunity that all of us have to have those documents in one secure place. Uh, dare I say that, you know, trying to, I'm not even allowed to go into my drawer to get my own stuff. <laughs> That's why I have copies of it all. Uh, but having it so that they too can safely secure their documents as we work to end homelessness in Baltimore City and work with folks who are suffering in our city. And the last thing that I'll touch was our 100 day tracker. Uh, Dan Ridge and Dan Hanowitz, who leads up our office. Of the this team had the task of, of developing this. And as we continue uh, to navigate uh, the health and economic consequences of COVID 19, uh, something that adds on to uh, Baltimore's existing efforts, as we say, and our over and unrelenting violence epidemic. To put the city on the new path, uh, we knew that my administration needed to operate with greater urgency, trans transparency, accountability, and really that deep commitment to equity. But the urgency and transparency are just as important as everything else. We knew that we need to show progress over time, and uh, not just tell people what we've accomplished, but show them. Uh, with my team, we assemble a list of actions that we believe we could handle it in the first 100 days so that our residents and everyone alike could see the transformation of city government in real time. It is bolt bolster community interaction with the work happening inside uh, City Hall with our communities, and we look forward to continuing that kind of innovative work. Uh, we will be a city driven by data. We will be open with that data, and we will continue to innovate in ways that allow all of Baltimore's neighborhoods to have the information and data necessary to work with us to improve Baltimore to be the best version of herself. And with that, I'll say thank you, and Seema, I will take questions. Excellent. Thank you so much, Mary Scott. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat, but for those of you in the audience, if you want to ask a question, I think we are going to mic you. Is that right, John? We're going to mic so, the audience. Members. We're going to have, uh, we're in the end, uh, uh, for technological reasons, we're not micing the audience, but speak your question. And uh, Mayor Scott, if you would repeat the question into the mic, I think that's going to be best. Okay, cool. All right, first question in the chat, though, while you guys are thinking about your questions. Um, how are you using data to address gun violence? Oh, you yeah, know, this is, thank you. One of the how much time you got, right? Yeah, well, I could talk about this for a year. Uh, I think there's a few things, and I'll give some examples. Uh, we know uh, that that disease has had a stranglehold on the city longer than I've been alive. And one of my first uh, data decisions, so to speak, is that myself, uh, city administrator Shorter, deputy mayor Schnitzer, who heads up public safety and the police commissioner, I uh, no disrespect. I knew that uh, some of my predecessors didn't make data-driven decisions. Uh, so we know that we have a finite amount of police resources. And for me, I always tell folks that what I will not do is have them go back to uh, the policies that we had when I was a young man growing up in Baltimore, where if you were like me outside and breathing, that meant you were going to be sitting on the curb in handcuffs or just breathing. Uh, we won't do that. We know that didn't make Baltimore safe. We know that the way to, uh, from a policing standpoint, to deal with violence in Baltimore is to actually focus 
in among the areas and the people uh, that are committing violence. So uh, we have these things called microzones, and we had hundreds of them. And through data and analyzing them, we saw that they had the police focus in areas that were supposed to be microzones, were supposed to be the most violent. They weren't the most violent. So, for example, uh, I don't think any of us in here would think that Falls and 41st is one of the most violent areas in the city. So I said, take it off. We're going to make a data driven decision to say that this is not where you have to spend the majority of your time. But also, uh, we're doing that in the development of our group violence reduction strategy, uh, which is something that has been proven uh, to have a significant reduction in violent crime across the country, right? And Baltimore, unfortunately, has failed to implement that twice. And just to give a Cliff Notes version, since we're in a library, Cliff Notes version of what a group violence reduction strategy is, is that you know, uh, we all know that most of the violence in any particular neighborhood or district or the city is committed by a very small few, right? Uh, the best way to reduce that through is to focus on those people the ones that are actually committing the violence. So uh, what we are doing is partnering with actual data professionals who do this work to go and identify who those groups are. And what we will then do is go to those individuals and say, this is your last chance. We know that your group is responsible for this large percentage of violence that is happening in this area or in our city. We are going to offer you the opportunity to change your life. And this is the most important part because this is where the city failed the previous two times. Uh, when, if we're in a room like this, because we actually do call them in and someone in a room full of killers raised their hand and says, I want out, I want to change my life, then the city better be ready to give them the opportunity to do that. Because if they do that in that room and we don't, guess what happens to them? They end up dead. And then that cycle continues to complete itself over and over again. So it's also about bringing in resources and other things. So we will have that as a partnership with our law enforcement partners that will say local, state, federal, if you don't take these other options, then we're going to bring the hammer down on you, but it's going to be hyper-focused on those most violent groups. So that's just two quick examples. Mm -hmm. So um, what is the city doing with all this data uh, doing about cyber um, security and what, what initiatives are there for that? So uh, this is a crazy, funny story. So uh, the night I became council president, I was sitting at home, I don't go to sleep until like 2 o'clock, and it's around 12.08 a.m. And I said, well, I can do some emails since I'm up, and I pick up my phone, and I'm like, hmm, my email's not working. And I pick up my laptop and say, it's not working on here either. So I call another one of my colleagues who I do also be up. Is your email working? I'm like, no, like, they didn't send us an email about the server going down tonight. And I wake up the next morning to a phone call that said we've been hacked essentially. Uh, since then, uh, B -CID has made, we've made a lot of improvements to our cybersecurity. Uh, it annoys a lot of folks. Uh, we have safeguards in place, we built systems that we didn't have, we moved a lot of things into safer, secure systems, and that work is going to continue uh, because we have so many vulnerabilities. And this is something that the administrator is, is leading for all of the city. And one of our biggest vulnerabilities was that we had so many different systems across agencies uh, that they can get a backdoor into this agency by going to this one because they communicate all the time, but they have a distant system. This system is updating and secure, this one is not. We have been working to eliminate those kind of discrepancies, making sure that we're doing all of that. Even simple things like when our employees are logging into the email that they have to get calls to make sure that it's there. Those kind of things matter. We're going to continue to invest in our sound security. The irony is, is that a year before uh, we, we had the attack, there's this video where we said, hey, we need to spend more money on sound security. And we've been able to make those investments over the last few years we continue. Great question. And I'm sorry, I'm not able to read the question, but I will. Hi, how are you doing? I'm good. Um, do you believe that data should be used to deconcentrate poverty, or will data be used to recycle poverty? 
Well, it's always about, it's not even about deconcentrating. We have to use data to make sure that we are being better than we were before by not just hyper segregating uh, uh, poor people, but also using data to provide opportunities so that we have less people in poverty in the first place, right? This is why you look at uh, things, how we're doing development, for example, like the Perkins, Perkins Somerset Old Town development, that it's not just going to be, oh, we're going to pick up a housing project and move it to another area and allow those individuals to return back and live amongst folks with mixed incomes. But also, uh, when you think about data, it's also about the health returns, everything else that play in education. When you start to deal with those issues in a real and deep way, which I don't even know a rose-colored glasses uh, impression that that's going to change like that, right? Much of this work that we're beginning, I always say to, to my fellow leftist officials, the work that you do, the best work that you do, you will not personally benefit from it in a political way because it's going to really take hold long after you're gone and you have to be okay with it. And when you're talking about that kind of deep change, the way that we're investing our capital dollars, the way that we're doing and building and renovating schools, the way that we're focusing in on providing education and getting people's health right, that all plays into how we have less people who are impoverished. And we also have to continue break down systems that force that and build new ones that allow people to thrive. Okay, um, one, one, question, one question in the chat still. Um, how's data being used to address vacant properties, particularly long-term vacants? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, we actually not know, speaking of data, uh, data websites, when you know an agency and it really use data in, in the way that housing has, um, when you look at code map and how we do, do use code map and what we allow it to do is housing uses data, not just about those vacants, but about the areas around them and the opportunities to work with ourselves and also the state to prioritize the militia versus, versus rehab versus receivership. All of those decisions are made in a, in, in a way considering data. And we're going to be expanding that because it's also about making sure that it's not just about the raw numbers. We have to look at the greater impact, how we can uh, use data to say where we can uh, benefit from having some of the smaller uh, individuals come in to renovate some of these homes versus turning them over all to these large groups, how we can use it as an opportunity, data to use it as an opportunity to turn people who are renting in East Baltimore into homeless like they're doing in Johnson Square. That's the kind of data-driven strategies that we're using the housing that we're looking to expand, uh, not to just housing, but beyond. Yes, ma'am. Yes, is the use of open data being introduced on the educational system or it's Well, I, I would say that I uh, we have a great partnership with the school system. Uh, there will be uh, some uh, open data and data use things that we're doing for young people that they will be a part of. We'll, we'll always have an opportunity to have conversations with uh, Dr. Santos and the board about ways that they they think that they can benefit from us and our data folks about how to help them. We're always ready to help and we will continue to do that. Thank you so much. In the spirit of openness and transparency, this is Ralph Moore's sister. I know. <laughs> so Ron is asking hard questions. <laughs> Anybody else? Nice Thank, Thank you. you so much, Mayor Scott. Thank you. <laughs>
Uh, technology is changing all the time. My staff and I are constantly learning about what the city's putting out on a daily basis. Uh, and so this is an event for all of us to learn, uh, regardless of age, regardless of technological backgrounds. Uh, we're all here to kind of convene together. Um, so thank you again, Mayor Scott. Thank you to the chat library. For Pratt Library, we are, I feel like the Bina Project has come home to the Pratt Library. Uh, the, when the Bina Project was first created 20 years ago, it was meant to be housed actually at the Pratt Library. It was going to be a neighborhood information center where all kinds of information would be uh, part of the Pratt Library. So we are home again here in the Pratt Library, our first uh, foray into a hybrid session. So thank you, Heidi and your team. They've been excellent trying to get us uh, to set up this first ever hybrid uh, event. I want to introduce my team, who is sitting here like the journalists on the side, <laughs> making sure that everybody's uh, having access both online, on Facebook Live, in the room. This was a, a small technological Herculean feat, I think. Um, and thank you to John, in particular, from the Pratt Library for allowing us to be happy. So my job is just to introduce you to the next panel who's coming up. And this is basically like the equity dream team for the city of Baltimore. We're gonna bring up uh, Justin, Jason, uh, Dan, and Dana to come talk about your roles now in the new administration here in Baltimore. And John, is that correct? They do not need to do anything, just talk. Uh, hi everyone. Um, you guys mind if I? No, no, no. no. Um, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Justin Elsass. Um, I'm the uh, chief data officer uh, for the city of Baltimore. I'm really glad to be here. I think this is my fifth, sixth. I'm losing track of which day of the day this is. You are the picture of day to day every year. When they do it in the paper, they always use well, that I don't... picture. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You are the face of the Yeah, we're technically Baltimore. They need to stop using that picture. Um, uh, so, um, again. It's destiny. It's destiny to be here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yep. Um, uh, I want to thank uh, uh, CEO Daniel for, for hosting um, and uh, providing this wonderful space. I'm really excited that we're, this is now one of the, I think this is the second event where the mayor's office has convened somewhere where it's the first event <laughs> <laughs> coming back. Um, and I want to thank Mr. Mayor for, for joining us. Um, I think it means a lot to the, to the data community um, and even a lot of the data experts in city government um ourselves for for having someone who's so committed to to bringing data to bear on on some of the city's issues um so what i thought i'd talk about a little bit is just kind of the vision for how we're using how we want to use uh data in the city um both internally and to be kind of providers of data for for you all to to kind of um solve problems with us um the vision that i keep coming back to is how do we make data part of every decision um there are a number of agents, uh, data is, is part of many decisions in, in city government, obviously. Uh, we have a lot of agency staff with expertise distributed among all our city agencies. Um, we are advancing in the way we use data, um, learning new sophisticated methods of, of you know, um, for instance, the DPW is going to be capturing GPS data so we can optimize our, our um, solid waste routes better. Um, the thing that keeps coming up, though, is is in order to kind of advance us on the mission of, of getting to what data might look like, um, you know, as part of every decision, it always comes back to questions around data access and, and data quality. Um, and a little bit about technology, but, but more so about access and quality. Um, first, let me say this. This is maybe want to encourage folks first to kind of think about what a vision for, for having data in every decision might look like. Um, think about, like, what meetings would look like. Um, I imagine meetings, you know, um, you know, questions coming up and someone in that room asking, where are the data? Show me the data. Show me the evidence behind what's going on here. Um, so that's that's what I kind of mean by that vision. And like I said, access is access to data is always kind of part of that conversation. 
Um, towards that end, um, we have launched an uh, initiative around data governance. Um, what is that? That sounds really boring. <clears throat> um, we need to establish some, some rules of the road. Um, you know, obviously every agency kind of runs its runs in its own direction. Um, BSIT is able to support, that's our, our central IT agency, provides technical support. Um, but we have, we have data driving a lot of decisions, um, but not a whole lot of information um, brought to bear on where that data came from, um, not a whole lot of standardized practices. Um, we want to start being better stewards of your data. A lot of this data is comes from an interaction between a resident and the government, government and we store that record and that's what turns into our data. Um, we want to be better stewards of that. And that's what data governance is about, is about kind of establishing better rules and practices about how we're using data. Okay, so how does that benefit you all? Um, for those of you who are open Baltimore users, um, we've taken a, a, a several steps already to, to try and provide better data and better experience on Open Baltimore so that you yourselves can be kind of turning data into information. Um, we're, uh, you've seen a couple of products, um, Mr. Mayor um, Scott uh, mentioned um, Open Checkbook, so that's one such example. Um, we also have things like CodeMap. Um, Open Budget was just released a couple of weeks ago. So we have kind of data products out there for, for folks to use. Um, one thing we've heard time and time again, though, is around the, the data quality um, and documentation. So where did the data come from? What does this field mean? Why are there so many missing values in this data? Um, establishing good data governance is going to help us address that. So we've, we're putting in some rules and requirements around documentation so you all understand the data better um, that we're providing. Um, um, we're kind of standing up some more internal processes for publication that way it's easier and clearer for the agencies to come to the table and bring uh, data. Um, one thing that we've heard is that it's not always clear on where an agency goes if they want to publish something on Open Baltimore. So we want to make that a little bit clearer, lower, lower the barrier to entry for, for agencies. Um, data quality. Uh, part of this data governance means identifying all the data that we have. Um, this is something we would also make public, but we want kind of a listing, a, a general accounting for all of the data that we have and that we maintain in the city. Um, it, again, this is not um, fun and exciting work doing a data inventory and literally cataloging all the data, um, but it's a really important way for us to kind of understand what's out there and what its quality is. Um, one thing I'm exploring doing is I'm not sure if this is, if anyone has ideas on how to do this, I'd be interested in hearing them. Um, as part of the data inventory process, typically what happens in an inventory is you list off the data sets and you kind of rate them on their quality and you rate them on sensitivity and these kinds of things. Um, we also want to think about rating them in terms of their equity or potential for bias. Um, so maybe coming up with some kind of rubric or standardized rating to, to maybe assess what is going on in that data set that we need to be aware of when we're, when we're using it. Um, and again, the intent is to make that data inventory public so that you all know what we have and what we're maintaining and, and have a rating of its quality and, 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 and things like that. Um, finally, um, uh, sorry, let me unpack my notes here. Um, I hate the idea of staring at a phone while I'm trying to talk to an audience, but I want to pull up my notes. Um, uh, there's also going to be uh, um, opportunity, more opportunities for residents to actually um, develop insights and share them on Open Baltimore itself. We want to build out more of an ecosystem. Um, there is a mechanism already there for residents to kind of log into Open Baltimore and build out their own data products around the data that we use. Um, but we want to share that, train folks. Um, SEMA has kind of taken up the mantle of, of doing a really great job of, of training folks on how to use Open Baltimore and why the data matter. Um, and we want to kind of, you know, um, you know, take up that <laughs> take up that mantle ourselves. Uh, a little bit better. So, um, uh, yeah, so that's, uh, like I said, that would kind of create a better ecosystem of insight and data and, and um, um, sharing kind of what's going on within the city and outside the city. Um, I want to leave it there because I want to make sure we have time for, for questions. Um, but let me leave with you with this. Um, right now, uh, we're in a mode of, of, like I said, doing some not so fun, <laughs> a little bit boring things around data when it comes to kind of policy and management of data, but we think it's gonna really result in one, better strategic decisions from our executives and our decision makers 
um, when they can rely on that data, they know where it comes from. It's robust. It has, uh, you know, it's of high quality. And two, you know, the more high quality data we have and the better rules we have it, the clearer we are about what we can and can't share. Um, we want to be on, on, we want to err on the side of being open and we want to default to, to, to being open. Um, we want to make that a, a standard. We need a little bit more clear process on rules on how to do that. So that, that's what we're after right now. Um, I'm happy to take questions now, or did you want to wait until others um, kind of chimed in? Or? Have you all speak first and then go there? Cool, great. Thanks, Dan. Hi. Uh, so, hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Dan Heimowitz. I'm the director of the Mayor's Office of Performance and Innovation. Um, there's some different parts of the office, but I'll be mainly talking about the work of the part of our office that's called CityStat. Um, for folks who have, you know, uh, followed city government, this city stat's been around for, for uh, a while, but I think it's important to sort of, you know, always just describe what it, what it does and why we think it's uh, important. And I want to talk about why I think um, this uh, version of city stat can be really, really effective, uh, you know, for the, for the city and for residents. So, um, so city stat is the mayor's uh, office that uses data to ensure that, um, city government agencies are actually delivering uh, services for residents um, as effectively and equitably as possible. Um, so we do that through um, processes that we call stats, which are basically uh, ongoing meetings where we establish um, measurable goals with city agencies and track those through regular meetings. And then through analysis we do as part of those processes, try to understand if things aren't working well, why is that and how can, how can we do it better? Um, so it's really a, a data analysis and kind of problem solving set of meetings around a lot of the services that uh, residents um, expect and, and get from, from the city. So, um, you know, I'll just give two examples of, of stats that we're currently doing under, under Mayor Scott. One is police stat where we're using data to consider um, the various strategies that the police department's using to um, uh, address violence in the, in the city, um, as well as how to um, improve the, the, the police department itself. So that's one key stat we do. Um, another one is something we call clean stat, and that's, uh, as the names would make it sound, uh, an effort to use data to understand um, the work of the city agencies that are responsible for keeping the city clean. Um, and again, how are we doing? How can we do it better? Um, and it's sort of really putting to use data for the way um, the city does its, uh, manages its, its, its business. Um, so that's, that's the work of city stat. And there's other types of stats on different issues and with other city agencies that, um, that we are doing and will be launching in, in the months ahead. I also just want to briefly mention a couple other things, including one that Mayor Scott mentioned, which was um, this tracker set up to see how well the uh, Mayor Scott's team was delivering on commitments in his first 100 days as mayor. Um, we're gonna be uh, uh, putting out a, another version of that, looking forward to the rest of uh, the Mayor Mayor Scott's next few years. Um, it, and and we'll, again, we'll put that out publicly, both what are the, what are the actions uh, that 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 this administration is is committed to delivering, and making sure we're tracking that and and showing to the public um, how well we're doing on that? So that kind of sits alongside some of the work of these these stat meetings that, that I've talked about. So city stat, it's it's been around for a number of years. Why is it? Uh, you know what what makes city stat different this time around? I think it's actually relates to three people you are seeing uh, you've seen and are seeing here on the, on the stage. So first of all, Justin. Uh, Justin's work as chief data officer is absolutely critical to ensuring that we have the data systems and the data quality that we need to be able to use the data to effectively help city government do its job better. So I think, you know, having, you know, the work of a systematized uh, agenda led by our chief data officer is really important. Uh, second, uh, uh, you haven't heard from her yet, but our chief equity officer, Dana Moore, um, I think, has been just an incredible um, uh, addition to the work of, of, of city stat. And what, what Dana has done is really push us to ensure that all of these meetings include a data 
driven look at equity. How equitably are we cleaning the city, for example, in that clean stat meeting? Um, so having a, a champion for that issue and ensuring that it is it is looked at in every everything we're doing and sort of you know being you know being the person in the meeting that's that's asking the tough questions about that i think is pushing us and more more importantly the the city agencies that deliver services for you the residents to uh you know to to, to you know to really consider equity in all that we're doing so that's a second thing and then third most importantly perhaps um mayor scott um the city staff process does not work if you don't have a committed leader at the top who actually wants to be involved in the process that actually is forcing us to use data in our decisions and in mayor scott's case is actually at those meetings asking really really impressive questions about the data and forcing agencies to really to answer that and to and to do better so to have a mayor to is so involved and so committed to data and you can hear the way the mayor talks about data um, his, is, is really just a game changer for, for the work that we're doing um, to try to uh, help city government use data more effectively. So those are three reasons that I am excited for the work of city stat in this, uh, in this administration and why I think we're gonna uh, you know, be, be hopefully helpful in continuing to make the city safer, cleaner and all the other areas where we're using data in these stat meetings. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Dan. Um, Thank you. Um, my name is Jason Hardbeck. Um, official title is Director of Broadband and Digital Equity. So I like to say broadband is the what and digital equity is the why. Um, so in terms of, of digital equity, I think the easiest way to explain what that means, at least to me, is that um, the opposite of, of digital equity is the digital divide. And the digital divide is typically defined as the difference between technology haves and have nots. Who are those individuals who are able to take full advantage of technology? Um, and it's more than just internet access, right? It, it means you need, you have uh, a modern device, a computer, a tablet, a smartphone. And most importantly, and the hardest to measure, and we'll get to the data side, uh, is the adoption piece. Um, you can have a brand new laptop and gigabit speed internet and have no reason or no perceived reason to be online because you don't have the skills or the real need, right? And so in terms of bringing it back to a conversation about today and day-to-day, and -day, um, it's one thing to have the data. It's another thing to have citizens who are able to actually use that data um, to take action, to, to make decisions, to inform themselves and others. Um, and so a big part of the challenge that, that, that I face is that we need to actually develop ways of measuring uh, digital equity, right? This is not, um, the, and, and there's really no one um, that I'm aware of that has done a, a, a good job of this, at least throughout the United States yet, because a lot of this is really, you have to focus on, on, the, on the use case, um, meaning how do you know when, when this is making a difference? Other factors such as, you know, maybe it's household income or it's other, um, it's other data points that have a, are a proxy for what digital equity means when somebody's getting the training and the access. Is that actually making a difference in their life and, and the quality of their life and the quality of the decisions they make? Um, I'll give some examples of some of the challenges. Um, and you know, one that is easy to talk about is broadband and, and broadband speed. And so without going into, into too much uh, detail, broadband is simply to, to be, um, Considered broadband speed, the, the service has to be at least 25 megabits download and, and three megabits upload, uh, which was defined by the FCC in 2015. It was, out, it was outdated essentially as soon as it was published and we're six years later. And we all know given the last year and a half, how inadequate that speed is for, for anyone. Um, but the challenge with that is that, you know, in, in our, our federal government making decisions based on data um, they collect around broadband, um, broadband um, availability is defined by the FCC using data that the internet providers themselves provide to the FCC. And for example, if one address in a census tract has access to service, the entire census tract is considered served, right? So decisions are made about entire cities um, access 
we and, and so that means that as far as the FCC is concerned, Baltimore City is 100% served by internet. Um, we also know the reality is much different. Um, and a big part of that, and certainly in, in cities, is affordability. Affordability is not a factor in how the federal government views broadband uh, usage or access. So what we really need to do is start to think about measures that are relevant to local uh, users and local communities. And so this is a lot of the conversation that's starting to happen. Um, it has been discussions, um, I think that those dis it, discussions at the federal level that have started to really pick up speed in the last four or five months for some coincidental reason that hadn't gotten a lot of traction in the previous four years. Um, and so we need to start having those conversations at the federal level. More importantly, I think what we need to do is start deciding for ourselves what it means in Baltimore. And what does digital equity look like and how do we measure it? Because obviously if we can't measure it, then there's not a lot we can do to change it. So I'll leave that. I'll leave it there. Thanks, Jason. Mm -hmm. And the last but not least, bring it home. <laughs> bring it home. Okay, so I'm going to put a bow on all of this. <laughs> um, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Dana Moore, um, Chief Equity Officer for the City of Baltimore, and I'm also the Director of the Office of Equity and Civil Rights. And my, my comms team back, back home at the office um, will be happy that I've said that. <laughs> they always say, don't forget about the whole of us. Um, Seema, thank you for, for pulling us all together and bringing us into the room. Uh, very happy to be here in Wheeler Auditorium. It is beautiful. Uh, this is the first public event I've done um, since, oh gosh, uh, a little bit before the pandemic. And what a, what a great way to sort of come out of the cocoon and, and, and be with the public. And I uh, can't be missed that my, my sister-in-law, Tony Moore Duggan is here and my sister-in-law, Flo Valentine. Flo is in leadership with the Friends of the that. Pratt Library. It's, it's small to more, baby. You know? <laughs> we're, we're literally, we're talking about connections. We're all connected in one way or another. And, and the last person that I want to mention is uh, Chi Chi uh, um, Nayagash Nash, Nash, who is the Director of General Services for the City of Baltimore, and she does an amazing, tremendous job. So, you know, you've got a lot of uh, thought leaders here in this room. So equity um, and the role of the Chief Data, Chief, chief Data, uh, I'm, I'm probably uh, the resident Luddite for the, for the city of Baltimore. So I'm really honored to be here on this stage and we're in the library. So any children that are watching, you will get uh, a little gift if you can search Luddite and tell us what it means, <laughs> put it into the chat. <laughs> um, the, uh, the role of the chief equity officer um, is new to Baltimore. I, am, uh, I don't like uh, the, the analogy, build it as you go, but really we are building the role as we move along. Um, Dan mentioned some of the things that, that, that I'm doing now. Um, and I teased a little bit when I said that it's the family tradition to ask the hard questions. So when you said that I'm in the room asking some of the hard questions, I'm like, it's not my fault, it's my, it's my family. Um, equity, uh, it, it, it's, it has to be made real for Baltimore. Um, I often say, and it is a fact, that Baltimore is the birthplace of redlining. It started here. Uh, we still, uh, as a city, are suffering the artifacts of redlining. Um, a questioner in the room asked about poverty and what are we going to do about, you know, data points on poverty? And the mayor's answer was, we're going to eliminate it. It's a big job. It, it's a big task. And it's only going to happen as we realize and acknowledge our past and not let it be our anchor and our weight, but let it be our wings to fly us to a better Baltimore. And I like to use that as uh, some of the driving mission for the, the, the work of the um, chief equity officer. Um, I'm, I'm me, I'm the only chief equity officer, but there is, a, in addition to these guys here on the stage that are helping drive the, the, the discussion and drive the analysis, there is an equity coordinator in every city agency. Every city agency has a person who is tasked with assuring that the agency is not just aware of equity concerns, but doing something to alter uh, past problems. Uh, we will be looking at the written policies that are guiding decisions within agencies that stand up and institutionalize inequity. 
but we're also going to be looking at the unwritten policies. It's the practices that have made Baltimore as inequitable as it as many, many perceive it to be. Um, we, she's not here today, but uh, Faith Leach has been brought on as the Deputy Mayor for Equity, Health, and uh, Children. And she's doing incredible work in this space, uh, dealing with, you know, COVID brought us some uh, real harsh realities, health disparities. And, and, and again, I don't mean to pick on you, Tony, but Tony works in the health field. And so she sees it on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, just the harsh reality that COVID has brought us about inability to access health. Uh, it, is not, it is not a mistake. It is not um, odd that black and brown families and people have suffered the impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic in a harsher way than our Caucasian and non-persons of color brothers and sisters have. There's uh, a long history of inequitable access to health care. Uh, there, it is established that uh, there are concerns uh, here, right here in Baltimore, uh, of accessing uh, some of the best healthcare providers that the city has. That didn't happen by accident. That didn't happen uh, just out of the blue. And we have a big challenge uh, trying to uh, eradicate those barriers. Um, Faith Leach is working on that. She's working as a partner with Dr. Daraja. And I think everyone, Dr. Jaraza is like a rock star of um, health officers, not just in the city or the state, but really across the country. She really led us uh, through the pandemic. Dr. Jaraza is the first person who I heard talk about the COVID-19 pandemic. She started talking about that in January, 2020. We were at, um, and some uh, you might've been there, we were at a cabinet meeting where she said, troubles, in, in, in phrase, trouble's coming. We have to get ready. Um, and so she and her team are working very, very hard to address the, the disparities and the health inequities. Um, she's she not picking on you, but um, a lot of what got the city through the pandemic and kept city buildings and agencies well uh, and open to the extent that they could be is Chi Chi and her team uh, attacking um, the problems that were existing in some of our buildings. And um, it was not fun to have buildings closed and have buildings not highly populated, but from the public perspective, not being able to come into city buildings to take care of your business was, was really hard. And the inequity of not having access to uh, digital services was, was just blown clearly, uh, was fully exposed. So the work of uh, my work, um, I take it, um, you know, the mayor said, we want to leave it better than we found it. And I see strides being made every day. I, I think that a lot of our audience are, are from uh, community leadership. Uh, I hope that all of you have taken the opportunity to tap into the mayor's town hall meetings, which are virtual. Um, there's another one coming up, and I think next week. Uh, for dis certainly districts one and 10, I think. But anyway, we're, we're trying to um, do the work to make the changes that are gonna make access to city services equal, not equal, equitable for everyone. And so there I'm gonna say, equitable does not mean equal. And if it's equal, it is inherently inequitable because we don't all have the same problems. We don't all start from the same place. We don't all have the same challenges. Uh, Dan and I are, um, I won't blame Dan and Dan won't blame me, but we are, <laughs> we are challenged by making sure that uh, all across the city, everyone is getting a clean neighborhood, a clean block, a clean alley. And uh, that, I think that's one of the, that, that's one of the things we are responsible to do as stewards of city, city uh, money city time, city talent, city obligations. So I'll stop there. Um, I could go on as you could, I, I did bring a two page outline. <laughs> and I, I didn't refer to it, so I could do that, but I'll, I'll stop now and, and uh, leave it up for questions. I'm in the same boat. I, I didn't refer to anything. I'm already thinking of things I meant to yeah. say and forgot. So. Yeah, I'll, I'll send a memo afterwards. <laughs> yeah, right. Thank you. Audience members. Um, so one thing is Baltimore is not only the 
birthplace of city staff, but Baltimore is the first city in the nation to use 311. And so the question is, what are we doing with 311? It seems like it should be an excellent way for us to track what's going on in every single neighborhood. I think there's something like 4,000 calls a day on 311 system. Where is the accountability? Will we be able to track that in open Baltimore? Will more people learn about how to use 311? So that's first question for all of you. Um, second question is simple to say, but not simple to answer. What's our alternative to Xfinity? I know. <laughs> 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 well, we do have an answer. I'm actually an really answer. interested in that. Yeah, one. I think there's an answer. <laughs> is, uh, is, so you mentioned that it's hard to track data or, or measure uh, digital access and digital equity, but is there anything on Open Baltimore right now that we can even get started? Okay, mm. you guys got it. <laughs> huh. Okay. Um, <laughs> Start with 311 data. Um, you know, it, it, occur, it occur, occurred to me sometime a while ago, and I think we've, it's just been on in the kind of in the, the list of things we mean to do and wish we had more bandwidth for. But we don't. We did, <laughs> We still don't have just a, a basic 311 dashboard. I think Sima, your team put one together, right? Um, and as has been the case with in so many areas <laughs> where the the city has has not always been there SEMA has kind of taken up some of the slack and, and you know really provided um training and services around data that that really we ought, as the city government ought to be doing um and one of those things is is just a basic through and dashboard um the broader point there being that you know open baltimore we need to move it to, towards being more about providing information and insight as opposed to just raw data and it, we're headed in that way um there are, like i mentioned um things like open checkbook um, just a couple of days ago, actually at another um, uh, uh, day to day session, we launched a, a finder tool around our uh, minority and women owned business uh, data, um, you know, our, our certification program with the law department. Um, so we use that to kind of generate kind of a just a quick search tool app so people can find our minority and women owned businesses. Um, we're lucky that we now kind of have access and for a while this wasn't true but we now kind of have access and, and a lot of data analysts in our city now have access to tools that make it very easy to spin up some of these products um so really we're at a place where the, there's no reason not to <laughs> um and you know obviously the three in one data is already there like i said you know we've we've to a large degree you know in the 10 years of the existence of the program we've left it to other users to kind of generate their own insights and develop analyses and and um, but really we need, like I said, uh, we want Open Baltimore to be more of an ecosystem where, yes, you can get the raw data. You can also get dashboards that we are using ourselves to manage our own performance. You can also create your own products and, and data analyses and share them on Open Baltimore. Um, so that's, that's kind of the vision for where we want to head with Open Baltimore. And it's totally a fair point that, you know, 311 data, one of our richest and frankly largest data sets um, just in terms of sheer volume um don't have like a, a just a, a simple dashboard around that we did around uh, clean staff for a while <clears throat> but I, I think probably need to revisit that at some point but um yeah so that, that's the answer on, on through on one um i was thinking in terms of the accountability and like is a closed 311 really a closed 311 and uh, are we gonna get perennial favorite <laughs> perennial favorite <laughs> is that part of the Closed show, means right? closed. So you know, yeah. So so to build on that and talk about how we use three one data. I mean, it's one really important piece of data that we use to consider agency performance, particularly in a meeting like CleanSat, where that is one of the key ways that residents um, request certain types of services. So yeah, we use it a lot, and we do use it as a starting point. We also know that you need to complement that data with other types of um, information to make sure that the picture you're getting from that particular data is, um, you know, is is accurate and is telling the full story. So uh, we have various ways of doing that. I'll just mention one. We complement the actual quantitative information from 311 by essentially doing what we call inspections. Um, of work that is, uh, you know, said to be completed by agencies to make sure that indeed closed 
is, is closed. So when we are doing those performance management meetings, we are complementing the three on one data with you know, these other types of information to make sure that we're having proper conversations about the real world, not just what that what that data says. So so yeah, no, we're we're very aware of the importance of like triangulating these types of information so that we're getting the full the full picture. Um, can I have a, just a footnote, um, you know, for everyone in the room and in the audience, we want you to use 311. Um, we actually receive the data, look at it, follow up on it. Um, what we're learning from an equity lens is that a lack of 311 calls in an area does not mean there's not a problem. And that's where the visual inspections come into play. Uh, a real game changer in terms of look, equity can be a real game changer in terms of looking at what the problems are and the challenges are in, the, in Baltimore. We know, again, um, a lot of black and brown communities of which I am a member, don't use 311. They, they will not call government. They will try to solve the problem themselves or worse, tolerate it. So mm -hmm. all that to say, lack of a 3-1 call does not mean lack of a problem. So mm -hmm. use it, <laughs> use it. Thank you. All right, I knew it was coming. <laughs> <laughs> so um, in, in talking about broadband and internet access in, in Baltimore City, yes, we have a, uh, from a residential internet access service provider, we have one uh, primary provider currently. Um, and I will say this, that, you know, my job and certainly our role is not to pick winners and losers. It's not to decide who's right or is wrong. It's actually quite the opposite. I think what we need to do is actually create competition and choice, right? Ultimately, how do we attract um, or develop alternatives and, ex and expand the offering, right? So it's not a it's not an or, it's an and. Um, and so it's it's too early because the mayor is going to be able to make this these announcements um, ultimately, right? So it's too early to share some of the details. I will tell you that what we are working on is is really transformational for for the city of Baltimore. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of, I think that, you know, when you talk about the planets lining up, right, we have a, a mayor and an administration that, that gets and understands the digital divide is really a construct of structural inequity. Like this is not by, as, um, as Dana uh, outlined, like this is all by design. We know it's, it's, it's the, the, it is the same reason that we have food deserts and, you know, housing um, challenges. It is generations of disinvestment. And so we need to treat that in the same way. We are, we are looking at making fundamental investments in the city's infrastructure that are not, it's not just about making slightly better internet for slightly more people at slightly better prices. It's really about kind of changing the paradigm for, for how we view this because broadband and access um, is really critical infrastructure now, right? A few years ago, I, I had a similar role in, in a couple earlier administrations and we didn't, I don't wanna say we didn't have a sense of urgency, but there certainly wasn't a mandate and, and we didn't have a pandemic to illustrate mm -hmm. to everyone, not just the people who were on the opposite side of the digital divide, but everyone, how important, how critical this was to just being basic uh, participants in, in a civil society, all right? So, so this is something the mayor and uh, and everyone on down really takes deadly serious. And, and the mayor said it, right? This is the equivalent of what electricity meant to the United States a hundred years ago, right? There were discussions about whether it was important or not for everybody had to have electricity in their house, right? And and that's, I think, where we finally answered that question when it comes to broadband and you know access to the digital economy. So the, the, the hard part is giving you, um, you know, specifics because this is also like everything else, right? It's, a, it's taken generations to get here. It's not gonna take generations to, to fix this or change it, but it's not something we can snap our fingers and overnight instantly have uh, access. Um, but I will tell you the vision, um, and I'll go public with this, the vision is that we will bring fiber optic um, to every address in Baltimore eventually. That is the that is the digital north star, and that's what we are working towards. That doesn't happen overnight, um, but we have significant um, opportunities, tremendous amount of of capital, of you know investment dollars from Washington coming to all the states and cities right now, and a lot of that um, is intended to support broadband infrastructure. 
So Baltimore is taking a very active role. This is not a passive decision. We're not allow, you know, we're not letting the market forces in the private sector dictate uh, this anymore. It's just too important. So uh, hopefully in the very near future, we'll be able to, to um, share more specifics. That's wonderful. Yeah. Sure. question. And by the way, you've got a, another request. If you create that three one one dashboard, they want a nine one one dashboard. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Nancy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Starting a data analysis project for us to ask interesting questions of city data that depend on multiple databases. We need access to high quality metadata documentation. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I used to work on this actually for the defense department. But anyway, <laughs> do you have a standard that you're thinking of using to manage your metadata? Yeah, great or question. Repeat, repeat the question. Um, uh, the question was around uh, uh, metadata. Um, whether we have a, a standard or how we're, how we're trying to document our, our data better, um, especially when it comes to people wanting to use multiple data sets to, to either join up, I assume, or, or bring together um, disparate data sets. Um, that's the direction we're headed. So right now, um, you know, I mentioned uh, kind of creating a little bit of a new internal process for publication so that agencies are aware of, of what are the steps and um, what needs to happen. Accompanying that is um, a, you know, a more comprehensive form for publication and intake form so that when they say, yes, I've got this piece of data I want to publish, they have to answer literally 20 or 25 questions that helps generate the metadata that you're talking about. Um, and there's a, there's going to be a standard template for data dictionaries <clears throat> so that everything we put out there will have a data dictionary defining what each field means, what the values mean, that, that sort of thing. <clears throat> um, it's, it's been a long time coming. We've, we've needed that for, for a long time. Um, I, like I used to be an open vault. I, I was still an open Baltimore uh, user, um, but even before I joined city government, I, I used open Baltimore quite a bit. Um, and so, yeah, that's that's exactly what we're, we're, <laughs> what we're working on right now. So what's your channel? <laughs> <laughs> well, so he, yeah, it's a great question. Um, <laughs> literally, yeah. <laughs> Tomorrow is a data governance meeting. Um, we're reviewing the new process there. And if everyone gives it the green light, the new process is stood up. So that's that tackles standing up a new process. Um, we, and then as new data sets get published, it'll be held to that standard. They'll be expected to meet all of those metadata and data dictionary standards. Um, we have yet to confront like, okay, we, we at least need to implement this for some of our big hitter data sets. Um, so we're going to have to retroactively kind of go back and, and establish that metadata for, for existing data sets. We're going to try to be picky choosy there. Um, you know, we really want the process to be, you know, for, you know, going forward for as people, but there's plenty of data that's there that we, we're going to have to go back and, and gather data for met metadata. Yep. So there's a question in the chat um, that is kind of tied to what this is about. So, and I'm going to bring this together because we've talked about metadata for 10 years. <laughs> um, we would love to have a metadata hackathon because we can help you with your metadata. I <laughs> love that. Um, I, I mean, but, so this is actually a question, Dana. I know you're also a lawyer, and so I'm going to ask this. Ooh. There's a lot of <laughs> issues with outside entities helping the city get its own data, fit, right? So, how can outside that in that governance process, higher educational institutions like the University of Baltimore? would love to be a part of that process and actually doing the work, but there tends to be a lot of legal barriers to that. And can you speak to how we can create a truly higher ed city public private partnership to help the city get its own data so that we can do this legally? And I'll say this because, you know, you said maybe the city should take up the mantle, but in some ways, Baltimore was created because the city will never be able to fully be sure. this on their own. You need somebody like a data intermediary <laughs> like us to be thinking just about this topic. This is all we do. <laughs> but in order to help you do your job better, so. So I'm the chief equity officer. I'm no longer sitting in the law department. And so this is not a legal opinion. I am not giving legal advice. Um, and I just want to say that, um, so going backwards, in my time in the law department, we did get a lot of requests for partnership. And we vet them as they come in. 
Um, and I imagine, though I do not know, uh, that that process still exists, that you just you vet the request as it comes in. It's a case by case vetting and, and, and um, decision. Now, the hard part and one of the hard and fast rules is if it's medical, um, we, we got a lot of requests to partner on uh, through, um, I'll just say different um, um, institutions of higher learning that have excellent reputations in the medical field. And they were there were a lot of requests for research partnerships. Those are hard because um, for, for lots of reasons, and this is an equity issue, and this is something that all of these guys have to be aware of. We are a data rich city for lots of reasons. The inequities, the, the structural racism, the, the deprivations, uh, the challenges have made Baltimore a very data rich city. Uh, we have an exquisitely high calling and duty to protect personally identifiable information and medical information for all of us, you know, particularly um, our, our citizens that are um, less informed, less able. Um, but uh, with, so I, I think there are hard and fast rules on, on that. And, and I, I hope that they stay. And, I, and we've talked about that among ourselves offline is continuing to protect um, personal information. That said, uh, we are a city that has some of the best higher ed institutions in the world. I mean, people come here from all over the world to tap into what we got. So how do you partner with that? Um, when I became chief equity officer, I received a lot of uh, invitations to partner and they did come from some higher ed institutions and we will do that. Um, but on a case by case basis, each gets vetted. Um, I think though, from if you really listen to what Jason and Justin are saying, the time is now. Uh, this mayor is uh, very innovative. He's very forward thinking. Um, the plans that Dan has talked about, they're very forward thinking. Um, anyone who has tried to partner with the city in the past and felt rebuffed or it didn't go as far, you didn't really get hooked up, now's the time to come back and try again. Please. <laughs> Please, <laughs> yeah. I mean, sun, moon, stars are in alignment. Mm -hmm. The other thing is that, like the it's it's not a yes or no thing, right? Like th I think there are plenty of like there's plenty of data that we could be making public and that we would want help cleaning and getting the met metadata put together um, for that. You know, it's not it's not not sensitive, right? Um, and so we, maybe there's a process where we get it to a certain state and then you know we remove all the fields that might be sensitive. We get it to the state where only information is in there that we would publish and then hand it off and bring someone else to, to you know, get it over the, the finish line. Um, so there's, yeah, like, like Dana said, no, the, yeah. the time is, the time is yeah. now. Come back. Um, yeah. uh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess for you, I can not put your question and see that I kind of already got started. My initial question is going to be, what's the role in the whole data ecosystem for city resources Institutions like the University of Baltimore and then the private sector, thinking maybe small, medium sized businesses. But since you're to talk a little about that, maybe it's more like what do you think the role might be for small, medium sized businesses in the whole data ecosystem? How, how, do you, how do you, can you just describe a little bit like an um, example of how you mean, what do you mean I by it? saying like if the city feels like these are all the things that need to get done, the city can do this much, the University of Baltimore is doing this much, how can we? tap into like local businesses that have technical knowledge IT experience and kind of get them involved to fill in gaps that um you know that local business development development. Yeah, it's a great question. There are a couple of um examples already where I've, I've seen that be successful. Um you know Code for Baltimore um, um is a group um co-led by someone at Fearless, a local um startup and uh, Mike Freed, the CIO for the, the health department. That's a really good example. You talk about forming these partnerships. Um, that's a good model for, for, for these things getting done. Um, I, liked, I liked the idea of the hackathon on a weekend for metadata um, because <laughs> hackathons in a whole lot of other contexts have not paid off, have not worked, but like as a one-time shot to you know, generate all kinds of data dictionaries and metadata, <laughs> that, yes. that could help. So yeah, that's exactly, exactly. The partnerships made. Sounds like a party. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that, that, that's one example would be that that kind of model. Um, and, and maybe we, need, we probably need more of it, like another 
system like that. Code for Baltimore is about building products and about building kind of software tools. And maybe we need something that's more around data so that we have a more systematized way of, of getting this help in the door. Um, there's a question in the back. Uh, so, Amy, you mentioned that the virtual town halls are an opportunity to engage the public and reform. Um, we had a discussion on like, the quality of access um, regarding um, technology, right? Mm -hmm. um, how else are you engaging the community and particular young adults um, if they ideally are, they have the potential to lead that way to So, I think the question is. Um, how are we engaging the community um, in addition to virtual connections? And I think that there was a specific focus on youth. Yeah, and young adults. Yeah. And young adults. So um, in, in terms of, in addition to virtual, we're starting to open up. We're here today. This is, like I said, this is my first in-person um, opportunity to, to talk. Um, I think by September 1, I think we, many of us will be authorized to really go out and do the public outreach. I know my office got authorization to do that. So just be on the lookout for more uh, public events and, and more rollouts. In terms of youth, um, there have been a couple of summits, I guess, like my word, maybe not the official word, to engage with youth uh, that were very, very well attended. They were virtual, uh, but that was led by Mayor Scott and um, Faith Leach, who, uh, are focused on, on youth and creating opportunities. Um, one of the things I have to mention is this is the first summer where every youth, uh, young adult who applied for YouthWorks opportunity got a job. Yeah. Huge. <laughs> you want to change a life? You want to, I mean, I still, oh gosh, I'm, I'm dating myself, but I still have my card where then Mayor Marion Barry gave my, me my first summer job. <laughs> it, it just got me on the path. So um, that's just a real, real positive thing that's happening. Um, more to come, uh, engaging youth on uh, solutions to crime and crime avoidance, uh, creating employment opportunities, uh, internships, just, just a real focus and um, yeah. And tomorrow's session at Baltimore Data Week, we are also in person, is about youth opportunities and diversion if you want to join us for that. <laughs> and we'll take your last question. Hi. Um, so, <laughs> Justin, when you were talking, you, you said that your vision for what a data driven decision making city looks like is that in every room, in every meeting, there is there is a potential for the question coming up show me the data, show mm -hmm. me, justify what it is that you're saying. That means drastically changing the makeup of who's in that room from a staffing perspective, right? So we need the people to do all the magic that you guys are talking about. Um, and it, it hasn't been the case that for years we've been staffing up in that direction. I know I've had conversations with you, I've had the same conversations with you, Dan, about what we as a city need to do differently to attract um, the type of people that will need to sit in that room to answer those questions for us. Um, so I was hoping you could share some thoughts on, on like your data fellows program, on the university that you're trying to set up, just so that people understand that there is forward thinking in that direction. Mm -hmm. And huge plug, employment opportunities. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great, yes, great point. Um, now hiring. <laughs> um, several really great uh, opportunities, even in Dan's office um, um, around uh, data. Um, yeah, it's a great question. Um, having data behind every decision you know, we have great, like you mentioned, we have some great expertise out there already. Maybe we need a little bit more. I think for me, what, it, what a big component of it is training our current staff and our current workforce and investing in them to give them the skills. Not, and it's not always just about slicing and dicing. You need a small team to slice and dice data and produce kind of data products and analyses. But having a broader workforce that is data literate and that knows how to respond to that, that information, knows how to manage a team and manage their workflow when they see a certain metric or see a certain number. Um, that's, and that is not as though we go out and hire a replacement workforce. I mean, that's a major training and, and um, you know, investment opportunity for you know, a workforce of 14,000 here in, in, here in Baltimore City. Um, we've we're starting on the path of, of trying to figure out what those opportunities look like. 
um, our starting point was just to pull some of those resources together and literally put them on Open Baltimore because there are plenty of, you know, kind of groups and communities and meetings taking place within city government um, centered around data and, you know, want to make sure that people know about them um, as well as some of the kind of free training resources that we have available. So wanted to get that out there. It's on Open Baltimore. There are even resources there for, for community and, and residents as well. Um, so that's one. You mentioned like a data type, a data academy or something, something like that. We're, we're exploring what that could look like. Um, but yeah, that's the data literacy component of it. You, you absolutely put your finger on the head of the issue there. <laughs> and I'll just talk briefly about the data fellows program, which is, I think, one piece of this, but certainly not, you know, a substitute for the things Justin talked about. So this is a another program within my uh, the Office of Performance and Innovation, where we uh, basically have a, a team of data analysts who we um, basically assign at the request of a city government agency to help that agency use data more effectively for something key they need to do for their within their operations. Maybe it's uh, figuring out a better way of deploying their workers for to respond to, you know, certain types of requests they're getting. So it's literally using data very operationally and helping them to, to you know, harness data they probably already have, maybe just aren't kind of utilizing. So we have a program where we're assigning analysts to help agencies use data better. Um, and what's been really exciting about it is we have two that are sort of employees of my, my office, but then uh, basically a bunch of agencies have put up their hand and hired, essentially offered and, and then done, done this, hired their own analysts to be part of this program, but basically be employees of their institution. So there's already, I think, a, a real movement, you know, that's happening in terms of more data analysis capacity within different city agencies. There's a huge amount of appetite for it. Again, it doesn't substitute for the things that Justin talked about, but I, I think it's really exciting to see how much demand there is for this, that type of analytical you know, capacity within, you know, within city government. That also points back at data, just plug data governance again. I mean, that certainly points back at data governance as well, because when you have all of this data expertise coming into the organization, you need to serve them with good data. <laughs> and and uh, we don't want to, um, you know, have a high powered car. We don't want the Mercedes Benz sitting in the garage because we can't get fuel into the car. Um, so yeah, that's that's another aspect of it is, is making sure we have high quality data to inform inform the organization. Well, perfect segue into what we're going to be doing right now, which is learning about some of the new tools and some of the old tools that the city has. Maybe some of us will actually apply for some of those jobs because we're really so well versed in having to do tools. Please do. Uh, but thank you all so much for being here. Next up, there's some refreshments outside of one. I'm the GIS supervisor for the city of Baltimore. Um, I've been to, I think, almost every single day to day, except for maybe last year, um, showcasing other uh, mapping applications and tools that are available to citizens. And um, as the mayor alluded earlier in the opening session, uh, in the open Baltimore has been a uh, asset that the city has offered for over 10 years. And you know, going to these events, a lot of feedback that I've received from citizens has been that they really aren't data scientists. They don't really know how to interact with data. Um, and so in December, we transitioned from our former open data platform, which was hosted by Socrata, to Esri's open data platform. And really the goal of this new platform 
is to really build in more of this community feedback and to start telling stories and putting some context around the data. So for those who may not be data scientists or data wizards who don't know how to download an API or do advanced filtering or querying, uh, we're hoping that this new platform over the next couple of months and years will evolve to start telling more um, stories and information around the data. So then you can take this data and apply it to um, whatever you are interested in, whether that's crime, grime, um, budgets, uh, et cetera, et cetera. We're going to have all of this centered on our open data platform. And I kind of like to call it more of a, a hub. Um, so you'll see that we'll start bringing in existing uh, data sets, dashboards, story maps um, that may already exist in other agencies, and we're going to have it all packaged up into one-stop shop. So um, if you want data, if you want dashboards, mapping applications, um, you will be able to find it on this site. And, you know, as the header says, you know, please come back frequently because we are consistently publishing new content and data um, dashboards, data governance, training, et cetera. So please come back frequently. Um, and if you have any questions, always um, feel free to contact uh, myself or Justin or through the email that's on the open data site. Um, so with that being said, uh, here's the landing page. Um, as you notice, we have a featured content section. So this is really what's the latest and greatest that we have published with the city. So we have COVID dashboards, um, Justin had mentioned um, open budget, open checkbook, some women and minority um, owned business data. So this is really where you can get a quick snapshot as to what has recently been published and what might, you know, we really want to focus on that will support the mayor's initiatives. Uh, we also are listing our dashboards and mapping applications, like I said, that many other agencies publish that you might not know or you don't want to have to go to housing to um, the mayor's page, to Rec and Parks, everything will be listed here. And you can you know, simply click on any of these cards and it will open up in a new window. And of course, we can never get away from the data because data is really the heart of the city and for our data transparency. So similar to the Socrata platform, um, we have the ability for you to browse data by a specific category or by an agency. And then obviously down at the bottom, if you need to contact us, our contact information is listed here. But I'm gonna take us back to the top. You may notice at the very top, we have a couple of landing pages. So a home page is a home page. Um, Justin mentioned data governance. So if anybody is interested in learning more about um, Justin's efforts and data governance, uh, we are providing information here, such as the mission statement, uh, what the plans are, our focus areas, and some resources related to data governance. Um, there's also some uh, interest in providing some training and resources. So this page right here, the training and resources, is geared not only towards internal city um, operations, but also for the citizens to use. So you know, obviously we have some things on how to use Open Baltimore. Um, we've partnered with um, Binia, so we are sharing information and content between our two open data platforms. Um, so you can access Binia's vital science data, um, some of their how-to videos, and then some of these new skills. So you know, are you interested in learning more about Power BI? Are you interested in, in learning more about GIS and mapping? Um, GovX. So we're trying to list all of these resources that are available um, that are free and accessible not only to city users but to the public itself. And there's also a lot of great groups out there that you know meet and collaborate and talk about data and um, transparency. And so we'll be able to list these um, collaborations and meetup groups um, and hope that more folks will start participating in some of these great um, networks that are out there. Some of these groups are fabulous, they're smart, um, and so I would invite you to um, learn more about it and participate. And then obviously we have some other resources, the data governance, which I mentioned uh, previously, and our Baltimore GitHub uh, repository. So for anybody who is open source, I think I saw somebody in the chat said that they were all about open source. Um, here is the location for um, our GitHub repository that contains a lot of open source material. So let's uh, focus, let's go back to the data. So again, we can never get along, get away from the data. 
Uh, we're hoping that this new platform um, is just as easy to use as Socrata that you may be useful. Um, we are going to be working very closely with the vendor um, to enhance and develop this content. So um, not only do we hope to hear from you for new data that you'd like to see, but changes, maybe new functionality that you'd like to see out of this um, website, please let us know. Um, and we will try to our best to um, you know, integrate those requests into the system. So I'm going to go up the top, the data catalog. This will give you kind of similar to the browse by category. This shows every single thing that is on the open data site. And you can, you know, focus it down to everything, data, apps and maps and documents. Um, you can also filter it by the publisher. Um, so we can just have the Baltimore, um, Binia and Baltimore City. And as you can see between the two of us, there's over 585 um, sets of data. Um, this can also include documents. And again, it should look very similar to the old platform where you have a list and a description and you can you know, click on anything and uh, you know, see the information behind it. Um, I'm gonna go back, I, I know there's a lot of uh, you know, interest around gun violence. So let's see, we want to are interested in finding some information about gun offenders. So you can query and look for the specific data set at the type at the top. If it's what we call spatialized, there'll be a map that will show all of the points on the map. Um, move this little window over here. Down at the bottom, if you want to look for a specific area or the uh, the legend, I can say, let's say, uh, Edmondson Village. I can Edmondson Village. I can query for an area. I can put in a specific address. So I'm going to say I'm interested in what is going on in Edmondson Village. And you can see the map zooms directly to that area. We have some very basic information on the left hand side, such as when the data was originally published, um, when the data was updated. And then we have a link to the um, view data table. If you want to find out even more details about this data set, you can click on full details and this will take you back to a landing page again that kind of looked like the Socrata um, that has the information about attributes, tags, uh, again the same information on details, the summary about the data, and then other links. So if you are interested in integrating this data into, you know, for an API, for a web map or an application, um, you can access that code here, um, open an ArcGIS online, create a map, um, you'll find all those functionalities um, listed down at the bottom. To get back to there, I'll go back to the view map. Um, we have, you know, let's look at the, we can look at just the table too. So if you want to look at the view table, you can click on the view table at the upper right hand corner or over on the left hand side and you will see all of the records here and the number of um, records that are within this table. And you can, um, click on anything, it will sort up and down um, based on the column that you might be interested in, but probably the real power comes through some of this filtering. So um, on here we have two ways. We have styling. So if I go back to my map and I go to styling, so right now we have a whole bunch of blue dots. Yeah, you know, that's great and all, but we really want to be able to, you know, see some differentiation. What are, you know, maybe I'm interested in seeing um, gender breakdown. So is it male or female? I can click on styling and you can see that anything that was a, a gun offender that was a male is an orange. Anything that's a female is in blue. You can click on any of the dots and it will give you the information around that um, dot. Um, and so this way you can build some very basic mapping um, capabilities and do some very basic analysis. If you want to do some filtering, very similar to the other um, window that I showed, you can filter the data as you move the map around. So if you're zooming in, instead of having to look at, you know, all 2,700 records, as you zoom in, it will filter the table that's on the back end. So I'm, going to say, let's see, I'm interested in finding out what's going on in my neighborhood. So in order to do that, we can simply scroll down to where it says neighborhood, and you'll see there's 214 values, and I can start typing. So again, let's do Edmondson Village. I start typing ED, gives me all the, you know, neighborhoods that have an ED in here. I'm going to say Edmondson Village, 
And you can see that, hopefully on your screen, mine's kind of tiny, that it says 0.81% of gun offenders are within Edmondson Village. So it gives you some statistics uh, around the neighborhood and how many um, locations or how many points of interest are within that section. I'll say, okay, well, I'm in Edmondson. I now want to learn more about maybe some of the race. So I can then click on the race query. And again, it will provide a breakdown on the race values. So 96.33% um, are black, 2.78 are white. And so it gives you some very basic statistics around the queries as you're you know, moving and interacting with this data. Uh, once you're happy with the filters and you want to say, okay, this is all, I know I have 22 here, I want to download this data. So let me go to the table and you can see there are 22 records, everything in Edmondson Village, all the information around, um, you know, the latitude and longitude, the address, uh, created date, and then I can download it. And we offer um, a variety of formats. And one key point, um, and I actually want to talk to the vendor about this, I kind of would like this to default. Um, right now, if I was to leave it as it is, you'll see at the upper left-hand corner that it says 2,698. That's the whole entire data set. I'm only interested in the data that I had performed on my query. So I need to turn on this toggle filter, and now you'll see that it says it's down, it will download 22 filtered records. Uh, we have a variety of formats, so a CSV or Excel format, um, a KML, which is compatible with Google Maps, um, a shapefile if you're doing some mapping, and a GeoJSON, um, which again is kind of a, a mapping a format that um, you know you can download. So I can download, it will say, you know, file generation in progress. Obviously, depending on the um, amount of records and your network connections um, will really dictate how long it takes to download. Um, but when it's when it's finished downloading, it will show up down at the left hand um, in the left hand corner, and then you can open it up and uh, do what you need to do uh, within Excel. Um, so I'm going to stop right there and see if there's any questions, um, comments, uh, suggestions um, before I move on. Hey, I gotta like, I, if anybody's talking, I can't hear them. I see something in the, the question and answer. Um, can you hear me now? Now I can hear you. Excellent. Um, so this is Seema. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, we wanted to know if the city stat data is different than Open Baltimore or do they remain separate? Uh, so is city stat data different as Open Baltimore? So. Um, anything that CityStat may publish um, will hopefully be on the open data site. So um, no, I mean, there could be some difference in data. Obviously, there's some information that we cannot publish for, um, you know, obviously protection. We don't want to give out information that, you know, might relate to juveniles or things that could be, you know, uh, identifiable information. So um, some data is scrubbed um, just due to law reasons. Um, and so, but for the most part, we try to um, provide the data um, as open as possible. So um, we're hoping, you know, we mentioned CleanStat that, you know, once that's up and running, that we'll have CleanStat on here. So, um, and Justin's going to be working with agencies to develop additional content. So as CityStat um, publishes and makes more information available to the public, it will be featured on the Open Baltimore site. Um, we had a question in the room about how to access the shapefile. Is that what you were asking, uh, Nancy? Uh, yes, yeah. so I showed on the, the gun offenders. And the metadata files. Metadata files and shapefiles. Yes, yeah, so that's a really good point and what I was going to get to. Um, so another big question has been the metadata or the data behind the data for those who might not know what metadata is. So you can download the shapefile and we are in the process of going through and any new data sets from here on out, we're gonna be requiring a data dictionary. So um, I know for, uh, I think it's part one crime, we have some, uh, oops, let me go here. If we go to documents, 
This will show, um, you know, any data that we have um, related to data dictionaries. Um, so we have incident reports. I'm trying to remember, what was it, part one crime or uh, a 911 calls for service. I think that's what it was. Uh, we do have this and we will be making it available. Um, we're trying to uh, figure out the best way to um, combine these two so it's not a single data set outside of the data set that is published. Um, so as these data dictionaries and metadata are developed, uh, we will most likely have a link in the summary that will take you to um, the data dictionary uh, for that data set. If she wants another example, tell her to search for open checkbook, the data dictionary. Yep. Uh -huh. Open checkbook, that's a good one. Um, Justin is suggesting to do a search on open checkbook to look for the data dictionary. And otherwise, he can actually show it when he comes up to you. Oh, yeah. So here, leave. Of course, it's gonna. Let's do open checkbook. It used to be very easy, and it's also hard to see what's this thing on here. Let me uh, minimize my screen a little bit so I can actually see what's on the top here. Escape. First row. First one. First one. Thank you. So I can't see it. It's got this little ribbon on the top. So here we go. Data dictionary. Thank you for, for the help there, uh, Justin. So we have the, like an open checkbook data dictionary um, that you can download um, and view. So just downloaded and you can see that. Yes, I know Office. Um, we have all the description, the metadata uh, that you saw on the details page, but then obviously some detailed information about what each of the con, uh, each, each of the columns um, contain. So we will be building this out for all new data sets. It's a new requirement under the data governance, and then um, you know slowly but surely we'll be working on adding these uh, data dictionaries to existing data sets that were on the open data platform. the source of the data when you're looking at a data set what the source is or who like who generated that data sorry i didn't quite hear you um can you show people how to find the source of a data set like who put the data up there sure so i mean in the um, data on the data catalog the data dictionary we have data source listed here uh, if you go to the actual data set, um, there is also source material. So let's go to open checkbook. Um, uh, just in general, how do you find the source for any of the data that's up there? Sure, it will have it under the details. So um, it will list it. What does that mean? Uh, accidentally selected the, uh, the actual app. So it, the source itself will be listed on the details on the um, data set itself. So let me go back here so I can actually go to Baltimore. So open checkbook. Data set. So if I go to full details, it, Okay, well, it used to have that here. That's a good thing. It used to have the source here. So uh, let me put that on the, let me talk to the vendor uh, about. So um, it should have a data source on there. If not, at the very least, um, it will have the description, you know, within the summary itself. And then um, just to show people how to download a GIS, uh, based file, either a shape file or anything else? Sure. So we have um, the download. Obviously, Open Checkbook is just a data table. So if it's a spatialized data set, such as the gun offenders, um, you go to the download tab. This is where the different uh, formats are located. So if I wanted the shape file, um, we have the shape file here. And then you can download it in the shape file format. Um, the other nice thing, as I mentioned, um, 
and this is going to be some content or some information that will be built out in the near future. I know one of the uh, things that a lot of folks liked about Socrata was being able to share and publish their own content. So taking the city's information and maybe creating a view or a map, um, you can actually through uh, this platform create a free uh, what we call ArcGIS online account. And this is a completely free. Um, you'll be able to have some basic storage, but this is a way that you can um, download, interact, create story maps, create applications, store and share content um, within an organization or friends, family, whoever you want to share it with. Um, you can create a free Esri ArcGIS online account and be able to play around with the data. And I know one of the, you know, when I went to the full details section, I know I briefly kind of glossed over it. There's a lot to show in only limited time, but some of these uh, capabilities that are in here. So if I want to create a map, um, once you create your free ArcGIS online account, if you don't already have one, um, you can create a simple map. So you can do something very simple by, you know, do a basic drawing and analysis. Um, so here it is, uh, you know, I have a gun offenders, you can add different layers. Um, so this, I, I highly recommend or, you know, would like for folks to start creating their own accounts and they can, you know, have even more uh, capabilities on doing some of these um, mapping and I said querying and publishing your own data. And also, I mean, this is phase one, obviously, was transitioning from the old system to the new system. Phase two, you know, where Justin and I are really focusing on finding new content, organizing existing content um, on the site, and then phase two, phase three, we'll really start focusing on the community side. Um, so this platform gives us a, a lot of capabilities to create some community profiles. Um, so keep, um, you know, keep keep close eye on the open data site. And, um, you know, as these new functionalities become available, um, you know, we hope that everybody can uh, take advantage of it and, um, you know, really use this information to make better decisions and to help the city. Um, because, you know, it, it really is a collaboration between both, the, both agencies, citizens, and, you know, visitors, the public, this is what we want. We want it to be a community tool to provide transparency and insight and help make better decisions. Thank you so much, Samantha. You're quite welcome. And I said, if you have any questions, feel free to contact us. I said through the Open Baltimore platform um, or the contact information provided through, open data, uh, through the day to day. Awesome. And if you wanted to answer any of the other questions in the chat, please, please feel free to interact there. And we're going to turn it over to Kimberly Rubens, who is the Vision Chief in the Department of Housing. Thanks, Kimberly, for being here. So you're going to show us a code map. Yes. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much uh, for inviting me here, Vinia, um, the Vinia team. Uh, a little bit about myself. I am as was previously stated, Kimberly Rubens, I'm the Acting Chief of Policy and Partnerships for the Department of Housing and Community Development. I'm also the Director of Research and Analytics, so I oversee the team that maintains CodeMap. So a little bit about myself before I tell you all a little bit about CodeMap. I have been with the city now for almost three years in four different roles, and I'm really passionate about data-driven decision-making and housing policy. Um, a fun fact is that I was actually consulting for the City of LA's open data team a few years ago, and I came across Binia's Data Week in my research and recommended it as an example of something that the City of LA should try to replicate. So being here to present today is a real full circle moment for me. I'm very excited to be here. So before I start sharing my screen, I do want to give you all a little bit of history about CodeMap. So the birth of what we call CodeMap Classic was around 2015. Uh, we started out uh, using a citywide tool, but we found in the what was then the Housing Authority of Bal uh, Housing Authority for the City of Baltimore, we needed updates on a more regular basis. So I want want to give a special recognition to Mike Galdi, who you will hear about later in this uh, presentation, who really took CodeMap 2.0 to the next level. He spent a lot of time incorporating a lot of community feedback from loyal, hopefully there are a few loyal CodeMap users in the audience, virtually and in person, like yourself. 
And I hope that you'll see, if you are have a longer user of CodeMap, that you'll see some of that feedback reflected. Uh, the reason why it's called CodeMap is because it was originally built as a code enforcement tool. But now we, we have kept the name CodeMap, and instead of being short for code enforcement, it's now short for community development. Uh, finally, a couple of other things I wanna touch on. It is connected to live data for most layers that you will see. Some are updated on a weekly basis, and that is the most infrequent uh, updating of any of the layers that you will see on CodeMap. Uh, I will also show you how to access the contact information for the architects of CodeMap, which are on the first page of the user guide, which I will demonstrate shortly. And so I really do encourage anyone who is attending today or watching this uh, recording to please reach out to our team. We field emails actually on a pretty regular basis from our community partners, community stakeholders, residents, pretty much anyone and everyone who uses CodeMap. And we do... Uh, we're happy to do quick troubleshooting of issues that you might be having in CodeMap, as well as take any feedback or suggestions that you have for us. Um, also, I highly encourage you all to put questions in the chat. We will have time at the end of my uh, presentation for those questions. And last thing I do want to say before we dive into the training is that um, you might feel like you're drinking from a fire hose. CodeMap is a pretty complex and powerful tool that pulls together at least 10 different live data sets, along with a host of other uh, analytical layers that my team have built out. So if I'm going very quickly, that's intentional because I only have 15 to 20 minutes right now, but I will also show you how to access other, um, other trainings of this tool so you can do a more in-depth training if you're interested in it. So with that, I will share my screen and get us started. So the first thing that you'll notice uh, when you pull up code map is this, well, let me exit out of that. You should see. Is this is the first view that you will see of code map. Um, it might take a minute or two for all the layers to appear because I am screen sharing through Zoom. That seems to be a, a bug. I'm also gonna drop a link into the chat with uh, of this external version of CodeMap. So if you wanna follow along with me, if you have your own tablet or computer with you. So first I'm gonna orient everyone to CodeMap and I'm gonna start at the top left and go clockwise. So up here, this is where you can search for an address or block lot of a specific property. We'll talk a little bit more about how to access property level information in a bit. Here is a hyperlink, which will take you to other DHCD tools. Uh, something I want to bring your attention to is this, uh, this hyperlink right here, which is key DHCD tools. If you click on that, it's going to take you to a landing page of uh, helpful links. First is the external version of CodeMap. We do have an internal ver version of this tool that is mostly used for our strategic planning purposes. And as Samantha mentioned, there is uh, sensitive information that we do house. And so we want to make sure that that is protected. This development map right here has a list of all properties uh, that are eligible for the homeowner occupied $10,000 vacant to value booster grant. This dashboard was recently built by the excellent Henry Waldron. It is the key stats dashboard. It'll give you a live point in time count of any vacant building notices or BBNs, the number of uh, new BBNs that have come online in the past five years. Uh, the number of recently rehabbed vacant buildings and number of demolitions. Over here, you'll see the money map, what we call our DHCD money map, which uh, maps all of our mappable capital investments for the last five fiscal years. All sorts of fun tools in there. Again, don't have time to go into it in depth here, but I just wanted to let people know that these are available to you. And then finally, our links for data profiles. These are also linked at the property level, but we have a, a data profile profile, I think similar and complementary to what Vinya has for all 14 council districts, as well as all 270 odd uh, neighborhoods throughout the city. So if I click this link here, it'll take you to a PDF. We just updated it, did a huge formatting change and updated it with the ACS 2019 data. We're still waiting for this population 2020 count, which will hopefully be released still on track in August. Um, anyways, those are the data profiles. Now back to CodeMap. 
So moving right along, hopping over to the right side of the screen, you'll see the layer list. This is key to the tool. Uh, there are literally hundreds of layers. Um, and if you just click this button, you can turn it on and off. Moving down to the bottom right hand side, you will see that there's this opportunity to return to your previous session. So if you're a power user of CodeMap and you have a certain set of layers that you always like to see turned on, you can click this button and get to that setup. This information button, as I previewed earlier, has a link to our user guide, which has the contact information for our analysts. So again, please reach out to them or myself at any time. And an hour long recorded training that would be really helpful because there's a bunch of tools that I'm not gonna be able to cover today in this training. Um, I'm gonna, did I hear a question? Okay, I'm gonna keep going. Here is the share button. Again, won't be able to cover that in today's training, but is covered in the recorded training. There's the analyze button, which we will cover today. Customize, won't have a chance to cover today. And the legend, again, very important because it's linked to all these layers. And as you see, as we zoom into code map, um, the more you zoom in, the more complicated it gets. And so this legend is gonna be very important to you. Pinch. Um, all right, so let's start with talking about the layer list. So you'll notice here that there are what we call these layer groups. And so we have focus areas, land activity, and transactions. Oh, wait, don't leave that to brother. Um, can someone, everyone mute yourself, please, well, I'm if sure you're not brother presenting? Want something. Um, so we have focus areas, land activity and transactions, permits and code enforcement, demolition, vacants and cleared land, property ownership, city programs and boundaries. And within each of these layer groups are more layers and more layer groups. Uh, if you have questions about what each of these layer groups mean or what each of these uh, bound boundaries that you're seeing here, you can click on this, these three dots on the right hand side and you'll get to this button that says description. It's a bit redundant. It'll take you to a, um, the REST service directory with a description of what our impact investment areas are. Um, something else that you might have noticed is that a lot of these layer groups are grayed out right now. That means that you're not zoomed in close enough into the map, into a specific geography of Baltimore to be able to see the data that's housed within these layer groups. So um, let's zoom in and see how this tool works in action. So you'll notice here that as I've zoomed in, all of these layer groups ungray themselves. And then here on the legend on the left-hand side, you will see that the symbology becomes a bit more complex. So I'm gonna spend a lot of today's demonstration focusing on this block right here that's bound by Mira Street, Greenmount Avenue, East Biddle, and Homewood. Uh, again, it took a minute for all the symbology to appear, um, but that is because I'm screen sharing it via Zoom. So uh, moving on from the layer list to the legend. Oh, one thing about the layer list, you can turn layers on and off. So you might notice there's this blue boundary right here. If I turn focus areas off, that blue boundary disappears. So code map is very customizable. And as I mentioned before, once you zoom into code map, you notice that the symbology becomes more complex. This is by design. So general convention for mapping is that less is more, but at DHCD with this tool, we believe, um, and especially when we're doing our strategic planning, uh, our comprehensive block level planning for our impact investment areas, we think that more is more. And plus, once you learn the symbology of this, uh, of this map, you can actually get a really good understanding of the block level dynamics of anywhere in the city, right from code map, right from your own home. So let's talk about uh, what I see when I zoom into this block right here that I'm outlining with my cursor when I zoom in. So the first thing that you'll notice is all of these purple infill for parcels. These, are, these outlines are parcels. And you'll notice that that corresponds with the legend that means it's owner occupied. So this to me, the 700 block of East Biddle suggests a fairly strong home ownership block. Directly behind that block on Mira Street, you'll see that there are a, few, a lot going, there's a lot going on. First, a lot of HABC owned properties. This is delineated by the orangish uh, brown that you're seeing vacant land that is owned by the city of Baltimore. This is delineated by the plus sign. So you'll see the vacant lot symbology right here, as well as the mayor and the mayor and city council public ownership uh, legend display. 
Another thing that really pops out at me when I look at just this specific block is that there are a lot of vacant building notices on Mira Street and a lot of re recently rehabbed vacant buildings here on Homewood Avenue. I know that these are vacant, these are active vacant building notices because of the orange square on top of the property, which corresponds to the legend over here, which says all vacant building notices. And then again, here right below it, recently rehabbed vacant building. That means that this property has received what we call a use and occupancy permit within the last five or six years. Um, so now I, another tool that I want to demonstrate for you is under the analyze feature. So I, that's just the quick high level picture that I get from code map when I look at this uh, set, this rectangle right here on my screen. But if I wanted to get more granular, technical, and exact with the data, I can use this analyze feature. And there's a couple of ways to do that. The first is you got to click on the analyze button and you can either download the data or select data by drawing. So if you press the download data button, you're just going to be taken to a splash screen that either get, brings you right back to Open Baltimore. So this is perfect that I'm going right after Samantha or data sets that feed code map that are available for you on Open Baltimore. So what we consider our most important data set is the real property. This is a data set, again, on, available on Open Baltimore, updated yesterday that you can download. There's about 240,000 records. Uh, I was close, 237,000. And then from there, vacant building notices, permits, vacant building rehabs, adopt a lot, open bid, uh, filed receiverships. Uh, again, all DHCD administrative data that we have made accessible to the public. Okay, so let's say that I'm interested in actually drilling down into this section of uh, Johnston Square, which is the neighborhood that we're in right now. And I can do that by using the select data by drawing button, which is at the bottom right here. So I was in analyze and then select data by drawing. I'm gonna move this over here on top of the legend just for screen clarity. So the first thing that I'm gonna do is I'm going to just select the data. And you'll see right now, these are the available layers that you can download. And I'm gonna select by polygon and I'm just gonna draw a shape around here. So I just start clicking, clicking, and then double click to close the shape. And now all of that property is selected. So what you'll see here is that there are 49 properties that I have selected. Um, it will pop up in a minute. I think again, it's just a little slow because of the uh, screen sharing function, but there are actually seven buildings under permit because I just uh, did this test it myself. There are seven buildings under permit, no receiverships filed or settled. There are six vacant lots and seven vacant building notices. And again, all of that data is available for download. And as Samantha mentioned in her presentation, it's available in different forms. I'm a data analyst. That's how I'm formally trained. I work in our studio. So I would export it as a CSV file, but you can also export it as a uh, spatial analytical layer. So that is the select data by drawing feature. I think one of the most powerful tools that has been added and really um, grateful to uh, Mike for all of the work that he has put into CodeMap 2.0. One thing that I do wanna to touch on about the analyzed feature is that if you see these grayed out layers, that means one of two things is going on. Either that data set is not selected, that layer or data set is not selected in the layer list, or you're not zoomed in enough in the map. Um, I, uh, so that's something that we cover more in depth in the recorded training online that is available via the About button. So I'm gonna clear this. I'm going to exit out of the analyze feature and I'm going to now move into uh, how to analyze a property, how to get property level information off of code map. One of the, I think, most powerful features of this tool. So there are one of two ways that I can do it. I'm going to show you the first way and then the second. The first way is to just zoom into an area and click on a property. And from there, you'll get this property pop up. The second way is to start typing this address, that a specific address that you're looking for into the uh, search address block. And you'll notice that as I do that, two versions of an address will show up, either on real property or the Esri locator. Whenever possible, use the, as the real property locator, which is up here, not the Esri locator. The Esri locator will be an approximation and might not take you to the specific address that you're looking for. So I didn't see my address yet. I'm gonna keep typing and I'm gonna 
And then I see that my address 1217 Greenmount Avenue pops up on real property. I click on it and it's going to take me to that property with a this bright highlighter teal outline on it. And so once I'm, I can zoom in with the mouse, get a little closer. And so now I can click on the property and learn all sorts of uh, helpful and useful information about it. Block and lot is uh, our unique identifier in the housing world. So it's very important to us, which is why it's the first thing on this uh, screen. Next is the neighborhood that it is in. As I mentioned before, we're currently zoomed into the Johnston Square neighborhood, which is one of DHCB's impact investment areas. You can see the owner, the sale date, the sale price, the zoning for the property, as well as lots of other helpful information. Um, so first is notices. So any vacant building notices that were filed would be here. Citations, any active or historic citations. So things like high grass and weeds, um, dumping, illegal dumping, that sort of thing would be housed here. Permits, um, as I um, forgot to point out earlier, another thing that I see on this block is that there's a lot of permit activity. That permit activity is, uh, is delineated by these gray hash marks on the property. So I'm, and also here, you can tell that from the legend. So I'm gonna click on this property and I'm curious about what permits were pulled on this property because that to, that to me indicates that there's some market activity going on. So then you, he, you click on the permits link from here and it brings you to this landing page, which summarizes all 13 permits that have been pulled on this property. The most recent will be on top and you'll see that the most recent permit that was pulled was a use and occupancy permit, which is why this property has a blue square on top of it. Um, other helpful information, any legal actions that uh, the department might have filed against the property, typically that's receivership. Uh, some more rarely it's foreclosure or condemnation. Uh, licensing, you can see if this is a registered light property uh, that is legally able to be rented as a as an owner, as a, as a rental property, sorry, I'm tripping over my tongue. Um, back in, I believe it was 2018, Baltimore passed, the city council passed new legislation that requires that all rental properties be licensed with our department. And we get tons of requests all the time from community stakeholders, city council people, city council staff, elected officials about whether or not a property is licensed for rental. So I'm gonna click on a different one because if I click on the licensing, for this property, which still hasn't finished all of its work yet, you'll see there's no record for this property. But if I click on this property right here, 712 East Biddle Street, and I click on the licensing button, you'll see that this uh, has a valid registration year license of 2021. It doesn't expire until 2024. There's the registration number and the date that the property was inspected. So again, just, by clicking on a property, you can get tons of really helpful and useful information. This will take you to the plat um, of the property. And then finally, as I mentioned previously, you can also get to the data profile for that neighborhood from a specific property address. So these are the Johnson Square demographics. Obviously the first thing that sticks out to me is the property, de or the population decrease uh, since 1990. Um, any questions so far? Um, I want to, I think I covered all of the basics of CodeMap in roughly 15 or 20 minutes. Uh, again, I would just wanna remind people of how you can access the user guide and the recorded training and our contact information. It's by, by clicking on this about button down here. You can click on the user guide or the recorded training. Uh, some tools that I didn't cover, uh, deeper dive into custom geographies and how to access data, how to upload your own data in different formats, customizing the base map and measuring buildings and many more tools. So thank you all for your time. And with that, I will turn it over to questions either via chat or from the audience. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Kimberly, for being here. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat, if you wouldn't mind going ahead and answering them there. Uh, but we are probably um, going to turn it over to Lillian. Um, Lillian, I know this is out of order, but since you're also remote, it'll make it a little bit easier for us to transition to you before we go to Justin for open checkbook. Is that okay with you, Lillian? Lillian? Sure, that makes sense. Yeah, we can hear you. 
Um, you want to do that check again, sound check again? Sure. What else do you need for me? That's good for everybody. Okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. We can hear you. And now we're going to check your uh, screen here. We're going to keep on and then we'll have Justin come in after her. Okay. I'll work on sharing my screen. And um, Kimberly, you may need to stop sharing. Got it. I just stopped sharing. Thank you. Perfect. And uh, Kimberly, just while we're waiting for Lillian to share her screen, um, are all of the data sets on code map on Open Baltimore as well? Or is that new? Or is that some subset? It is, that is all the data that we can legally share. And it is a new feature that was first integrated last summer when we launched Code Map 2.0. Uh, but the integration with Open Baltimore is fairly recent. We started that work back in January, and now all of them are online and updated regularly. Very awesome. All right, how's it going? Still muted. Okay, can everyone see that? Yes, we can see you and we can hear you. Great. Perfect. Sorry about that. I had to restart Zoom in order to make sure it showed up. Okay. Hi everyone. My name is Lillian Nguyen and I'm the data lead for the city's budget office, also known as the Bureau of the Budget and Management Research, also known as BBMR. I'm here today with Mira Green, Assistant Budget Director, and we're excited to show you uh, Open Budget, which is a new tool that we just launched. For context, um, BBMR has a suite of communications tools that we use to engage with community members around the budget. Um, that includes budget publications, taxpayers night, community presentations, and social media. So open budget is intended to round out that tool set to give community members an interactive way to dig into the numbers. Um, so probably the easiest way to get to open budget um, is through this portal that you're very familiar with now um, at data.baltimorecity.gov. Um, if you type that in your browser and scroll down, you'll see that um, open budget is featured down here. Um, but before I go to open budget, I wanted to highlight that right next to open budget um, is, another, uh, is another link. So if you click on that, that will take you to the data set that forms the basis of open budget. So if you like playing around with data with a lot of flexibility, you like pulling pivot tables or programming in Python or R, you can um, come here and download the data set um, and do your own thing. Okay, so back to open budget. Once you click on that screenshot, it will take you to the tool itself. It'll take a minute to load. Okay, so um, I'll start off by overviewing the different components of Open Budget, and then I'll go through a really quick example of how you might use it. For context, um, in June, City Council passed the fiscal, fiscal year 2022 budget. Each fiscal year runs from July 1st to June 30th. So we just began fiscal year 2022, and that's the year that this dashboard focuses on. On arriving to this webpage, you'll see that um, the dashboard shows you the budget for the city overall. So that means um, it's for all city agencies. Um, at the very top here, uh, you'll see that just a couple of summary numbers. 
So just like the budget itself, the dashboard has two main sections. The operating budget, which contains position, position information as well, and then the capital budget. Um, so the quick summary numbers show us that the city has a $3.8 billion operating budget, um, which also includes funding for about 14,000 positions, full-time positions, and a $487 million capital budget. Okay. So as we scroll down, uh, we see, we get into those two main sections. So first we have the operating budget section and you'll notice as you're scrolling around um, that there are definitions kind of scattered throughout, but if you ever want to um, dive into a specific definition, you can also access a full data dictionary um, with the link in the sidebar over here. Um, so the first section is the operating budget, which is the budget that funds um, the day-to-day -day operations of the city. So things like staff or supplies. Um, and at the very top of that section, we have two pie charts that uh, give you a really quick overview of how the budget is structured. So again, this is for the city overall. Um, the very first pie chart shows you the operating budget by fund. Um, which is, oh, and um, when you look at the pie charts, when you hover over them, um, you'll notice that you can access a little bit more detail about the individual slice, and that also includes some definitions to help you better navigate. Um, so fund is the bucket of, of money by revenue source. Um, and at BBMR, we primarily focus on the general fund because uh, that's where the city has the most flexibility in terms of how to spend its money. Next, we have um, a pie chart by object, which is a grouping of, of the ways the money is spent within the budget. And again, if you hover over, you can see um, more details about the different slices. Finally, as you scroll down, you'll see um, what I'm calling detail tables. And this, this works sort of like Excel. Um, you can sort just like you would in Excel. And then there's a little search feature over here. And again, if you access the data dictionary, it'll walk you through every single column in case you, you need a little assistance um, in terms of understanding what each column means. So that's the operating budget by line item. You can see it's pretty long. Uh, there's over a thousand um, pages by with just 10 entries each. So it's it's maybe um, better to navigate this through, through the Excel um, sheet if you're interested in really diving in. Uh, next is the positions detail. Um, and that just shows every position that is budgeted for uh, in this year's budget. And finally, we get to the capital budget, um, the second section. And uh, with the capital budget, um, that's the budget for all the physical infrastructure projects in the city. And here you can scroll through and see um, each project as it's funded year by year. And just one more note, um, the position table only includes the permanent full-time positions, so no part-time positions. All right, um, so that's, it's a pretty simple dashboard. Um, and I, I've actually left out a key feature and that's it for the overview. So the key feature that I wanted to highlight now is this drop down on the left-hand side. Um, so if you go to this drop down, a cool, a cool feature of this drop down is that it allows you to filter specifically for an agency. So I'm just gonna go to Rec and Parks and you can see that the data all uh, filters for just Rec and Parks. Um, and we get an overview at the top here of how large the budget is for the agency. Um, so scrolling down, we'll see that uh, the pie charts show 
operating by fund. Um, something of note is that uh, Rec and Parks is primarily funded by the by the general fund. Um, something I'm noticing when looking at the pie chart for operating by object is that we're seeing a lot of the budget is um, budgeted for salaries and personnel costs. So it looks about to be about half. And as we scroll over, I'm seeing that it takes up about 45% of Rec and Parks budget. Um, similarly for personnel costs, which are benefits such as health and retirement benefits, um, that's another 14%. So a lot of the Rec and Parks budget is taken up by um, personnel. Okay, so scrolling down to operating detail. Um, one way you might wanna use this dashboard is to explore things that you might've heard about in the news. So some of you might have been to the Cahill Recreation Center, or if you haven't, then you might have heard about the major renovation that, um, it, that was recently completed on that rec center. Something you could do is you could type in Cahill over here, for example, and that pulls up all the relevant detail line items. Um, something I'm noticing is that uh, Cahill is budgeted under activity 20. So, um, under the service called Community Recreation Centers. And I'm also noticing that um, Cahill is funded solely through the general fund. On the right-hand side here, we see uh, the last three years of budget information, and we're seeing a large increase in the operating budget for Cahill. Um, and that makes sense as um, the center was much smaller, and now with the big renovation, there are increased costs to support a larger center. Similarly, we can search in the position detail and see some of the permanent full-time positions um, that have been budgeted to, to help run the center this year. We do the same thing with the capital budget. Um, we can see probably the last uh, bit of capital funding to help carry the, the renovation through. Um, so it's a really simple dashboard, but we're excited that it will help um, community members explore the data a little bit easier. Um, we're looking forward to adding more data in the future and more functionality. So if you have any suggestions or any questions, um, please feel free to email us at budget at baltimorecity.gov and um, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. Thank you so much, Lillian. Uh, I am so overwhelmed with open budget right now. <laughs> in such a positive way, this is so exciting. Having been in the city of Baltimore for 15 years and watching all this data available with such a quick um, you know, flick of your wrist, essentially. I don't know how much effort you put into it, but it's amazing for us to see it. I'm thinking of like, we could have an entire vital signs budget indicators section <laughs> now that you have all this data. Um, quick question in the chat was, is the police part of an agency? And then if there are any questions in the room, yeah. Yes. So you, you can access police. So police is part of the city's budget. We're just clarifying in terms of city versus state. Um, TJ is in the room. Go ahead. Um, is there a way to access, or maybe you already went over this, like how much tax revenue there is year over year, or like what what grants are coming in, what tax revenue is coming in, like how the budget's being funded? How's the budget being funded? Is there a way to show that? It, it is in our budget publications currently. There are detail tables um, that is... Uh, a planned data source that we're going to add to the dashboard. Um, it's So it's not available currently, but there are plans to add revenue to make it a little easier to sort through. Thank you so much, Lillian. Um, there's a couple of questions in the chat, if you wouldn't mind kind of going there and answering that. And in the meantime, we're gonna transition over to Justin, who's actually in the room, and talk about open checkbook. So this budget is what the city has budgeted, and I guess in some ways it makes sense, this is what the city actually spends when we thought we were on the checkbook. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, Justin. 
floor is yours. Oh, can everyone hear me? Oh, sorry, we had echo in the room. I think we still have echo in the room. Hi again, everyone. Um, my name is Justin Alsace, uh, Chief Data Officer. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me at this point. Okay. Yes. All right. Um, so I'm going to walk you through uh, Open Checkbook. Um, uh, as Suma just mentioned, um, you know, we'll only give you what we budgeted for. Open Checkbook is what we've actually spent. Um, this was data that wasn't public um, up until. April of this year. Um, so just highlight that to mention that, you know, Mayor Scott wasn't kidding when he, he said he's committed to using data for his administration and, and really being open and transparent about these things. Um, you know, I think that's also evidenced by kind of the proliferation of new things that you're seeing out of the Baltimore. Um, we have a community that's that, of, of data analysts and folks across city agencies that are just, you know, they've been chomping at the bit for the last couple of years to, to Make some of their work public, and, and now we kind of get to, to kind of reap the benefits of that. Um, okay, open checkbook. Um, if you go to Open Baltimore, there's two ways you can get to it. One is from the mayor's page. Um, so if you'd like, you could always type in mayor.baltimorecity.gov/slash open checkbook. Um, or to visit the mayor's site it's on the left hand side. There, um, but also available, um, you know, visit up in Baltimore. Um, scroll down to the featured content, and it's here. Open checkbook. Um, before we dive into the dashboard, as others have pointed out with their dashboards, um, the data fueling the dashboard is also available if you want to download and play with it um, or connect to a, um, you know, connect to the API or, or however you intend to use it. If you search open checkbook in this main bar, you'll see both fiscal year 2020 and now fiscal year 2021. So um, today you are seeing um, fresh off the press uh, data, um, fresh, out of the, wait, fresh out of the oven, hot off the presses. <laughs> um, mixed metaphors. Um, so that's, uh, this is brand new data. It's for Q quarter one through quarter three of the fiscal year. That means June, uh, July 1st of last year through March of this year. Um, when we initially launched uh, Open Checkbook back in April, um, we, we only had fiscal year 2020 data to, to wrestle with. So this is a pretty mas massive new um, tranche of, of data that we're really excited to, to be able to add. Um, and it does mean that we added one or two kind of features to, to Open Checkbook as well that I'll show you. Right, so um, when you click on open checkbook, um, this is what eventually comes up. <laughs> and I'll push my channel bar. My push open. The at home audience can see me squinting at the. <laughs> I don't know where to. I'm trying to click and drag. Oh, here we go. Okay, great. Um, open checkbook. Right, so um, massive introduction here. Um, you know, what we're trying to do is, again, we're building products to try to tell a story or give you some kind of insight. We need to give a lot of context around a lot of the data. Um, you know, those of you who have worked with data on Open Baltimore previously know there are data quality issues and documentation issues. 
um, but also just questions of how that data is collected in the first place, where it comes from, and what are all the kind of manipulations and, and slicing and dicing that happened to it before it ended up on the Baltimore. Um, so we try to provide a little context there of what this even is, why we would want to publish this kind of thing. Um, down here in the lower left, um, we've got a couple of instructions here. So the little um, circle icons with the eye on them, when you hover over them, there'll be additional uh, information. Um, and then links to, again, the, the open checkbook, you know, raw data, um, salary data. We wanted to link to both that and the budget. And actually, I think of it, we need to link to the open budget here. We should change that link because right now it's just linked to um, uh, the BBMR website. Yeah, the, the PDF. Um, so one reason we link to salary data here is because such a large portion of the budget is made up by salary. And that's a question we often get. Um, in fact, I haven't checked recently, but usually that's our like number one downloaded, number one visited data set on Open Baltimore. Um, so in any case, uh, over here kind of in the middle, you get a couple of summary statistics, um, total spending in Open Checkbook, the number of transactions that it contains and the first and last date uh, of transactions in, in the dashboard. Um, when you, this is kind of a new feature, obviously, is with the addition of fiscal year 2021 data, we want to make sure you can kind of break it apart and, and um, just look at one fiscal year at a time. Like I mentioned, for 2021, it's July 2020 through March of 2020, those first three quarters. Um, when we launched Open Checkbook, we committed to quarterly updates, so you can expect the last, at least the last quarter of 2021 to be published in October. <laughs> um, over here on the right hand side, you can see a couple of, of data visualizations. This first page is meant to just be kind of an introduction to what this is and a couple of very high level statistics. We're about to change pages. Um, we'll step through it and we can drill quite a bit deeper. Um, so over here on the right hand side, you've got breakdown by agency, breakdown by um, where the fund, what, which fund it came out of, um, general fund or other. There, um, one thing I should mention is when it comes to data quality, and we highlight this in the text over here, um, the transaction data was very difficult to get. It's in an antiquated system. Um, it needed to go through several cleaning steps to get it on par with what we would expect to publish on Baltimore. We are quickly moving away from that system and there's a lot of financial data but buried in there um, and we're moving to a new system you might have heard um, you know in the news outlets um, something about workday um, a lot of the, how the system uh, how the city operates it's it's an enterprise resource planning tool um, and that means a lot of the government operations and how we budget and spend and all like and all be managed in one modern um, system and so it's going to eventually enable us to get better data and more regularly updated data we're not quite there yet but it hasn't um, we haven't made that transition and so the reason you're getting this checkbook this transaction data kind of in quarterly updates as like a batch is because we're still pulling it out of that old old um, technology and having to do a lot of manual cleanup work to, to get it to this point um, so a big shout out to the finance department um, for for helping to that, that process. Okay. Um, down here, uh, sorry, I'm moving further down. Uh, okay. Arrows uh, down at the bottom to navigate. Um, you'll see this one of four, so there are four pages. Um, you can also use these links um, if you want to be kind of walked through an example of insight or, or take you straight to the data. If we click this right hand, um, the right arrow, it'll take us to the second page where we do kind of step you through how you might slice and dice and try to develop some insights. Um, so you'll see this highlighted pane right here in the center. Um, this is where you want to focus because it's going to show you how to, to operate uh, Open Checkbook. Um, so it says click through the buttons at right to, to learn how to uncover insights. Obviously, if you, you know how to do this kind of thing, um, you know, it's not that fancy the dashboard. So, um, you know, a lot of you are probably familiar with this type of dashboard and, and, and get right into it. But 
um, for those of you who aren't and are new to kind of using something like this, um, if we click this button, it's going to help us filter. So it says, first we'll look at office of black spending. Um, when we hit this button, what you'll see is uh, over on the uh, left hand pane, this is kind of a control pane for you. Um, it's selected office supplies. So now we're looking only at spending that was on office supplies. We click again, maybe we're interested in, in office supplies um, purchased by the police department. Um, so it applies that filter again. Up here you see the police department. And then maybe we're interested in like who are some of the top vendors. Um, so you could click on one particular vendor. Um, <coughs> that work? Interesting. There it is. Okay. Um, so it's highlighted um, the top um, office supply uh, vendor to the Baltimore City Police Department. Um, so that's just an example of some of the slicing and dicing you can do. Like I said, this is meant to kind of guide you if you're, if you're not accustomed to, to this kind of tool. Um, now, if you ready to go, kind of step over to the next page or use the arrow down here. Um, so this is exactly what the, the title of the left hand in the upper left um, <laughs> indicates, the spending explorer. Um, so now it's up to you to kind of cut the data and find what it is that you're, you're interested in. Um, break down by agency, category, vendor. We also have a timeline of, of spending, uh, monthly spending here, and, and the total we have shown on the first page. And obviously all of those things update. Um, you know, as you as you do your slicing and dicing, we can also search by um, vendor uh, if you'd like over here. Um, but in any case, that's uh, that's open checkbook. Um, the last page is uh, mostly just some documentation, a glossary of some financial terms, a lot of which I had to learn even to get involved with building open checkbook because I'm not a finance person. Um, uh, roadmap, just kind of detailing out what are the things we've done and some of the changes we've made. And, and this will also get updated soon with, with kind of the next step. So for October, what you should expect to see in October. Um, then a couple of technical notes, again, you know, trying to document what, what is the source of data. So our general ledger, um, again, in, uh, in a coming term, I get to, to, to learn, to learn <laughs> to build this. Um, General ledger is a system used to store and organize financial data. Um, so, and then just one word of caution, we had a technical glitch with the reporting that came out of that folder, the, the system that I mentioned, our old general ledger. Um, and so for the months of December through March, at the moment, it's only accurate to the month. So you're gonna see that the first day of the month is the day for all of the transactions for that month, as opposed to the exact day of the transaction. Um, we're gonna we're gonna get that fixed, um, so that shouldn't stay on there for long. But just in case you're you're wondering if you're trying to drill down to specific transactions and see that they all occurred on the first of the month, um, that's why. Um, like I said, we have some some old systems hanging around that we're eager to move off of, and uh, this is the kind of thing that thing can resolve. Um, that's all I've got. Um, let me pull up the chat and see if anyone has questions. Um, no questions right now, and we're actually no. just over time. So, but thank you so much, Nestor. Yeah. Um, <laughs> thank you so much to the entire mayor's office for helping us do this and the Pratt Library. Uh, we could not have done this without them. John mm -hmm. is like the wizard in the back, making sure the hybrid was. Uh, was working. We do have an evaluation form for those of you that are online and for those of you in the room, we're going to send it to you via email. Thanks so much to my team. Uh, maybe you'll get some sleep at the end of this week. <laughs> and if you're around tomorrow, join us. Uh, we have one more session this afternoon and we are around tomorrow for a youth data. So thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.